Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? I can see you, but I can't hear you at the moment, Mr. Beer. Uh, I'll try again. Can you now no, I can. hear me? No, I can. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. And we can see and hear you. May I call Thank Lord James Arbuthnot, please? Of course. I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. But Lord Arbuthnot, I am um, I'm counsel to the inquiry. My name is Jason Beer, as you know. Can you give us your full name, please? James Norwich Arbuthnot of Edrum. Uh, thank you very much for providing the inquiry with a very detailed uh, witness statement and for giving evidence um, today to assist us in our investigation. In relation to the uh, witness statement that you've provided, uh, can we look at it, please? It's the only time I'll ask you to look at a hard copy document. Um, the URN is WITN 3020100. The witness statement is 180 pages in length, excluding its exhibits, and dated the 12th of March 2024. Can you turn to page 180, please? Yes. Um, is that your signature? It is. And are the contents of that witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. As I've said, your witness statement is exceptionally detailed. You've kindly devoted what's obviously been a substantial period of time uh, to the making of it, and you've set out relevant events in chronological order adding in your recollections where you have uh, remaining recollections and providing us with documents in your possession. Yes. Uh, that witness statement will be uploaded to the inquiry website today, so it's available for public view. I'm accordingly not going to ask you uh, about every matter within it. Good. Uh, it stands as your evidence and is being um, made available, as I say. Instead, I'm going to take you, if I may, to some of the more significant events that have occurred over the last 15 years or so, i.e. since your first involvement uh, with uh, the Horizon system and the post offices running of it, um, which was in April 2009, I believe, yes. and ask for your uh, further recollection about them. Yes. Uh, can we start, please, with a little about your background? Would you agree with this summary? You were formerly a barrister practicing in chancery matters. Yes. Um, you were a member of parliament between 1987 and March 2015. Yes. And in that period, you were a backbench MP. Yes. You held um, senior positions in government, including in trade and industry, in work and pensions, and in defense. Yes. And you held senior positions as an op opposition MP including as Assistant Chief Whip, Shadow Trade, Secretary for Trade and Industry, and Chair of the Defence Select Committee. I was actually full Chief Whip. I'm so sorry. Uh, in October 2015, you were made a life peer. Yes. You have been extensively um, involved in and played a significant role in the investigation of the Horizon system, the use of data uh, from that system to prosecute and bring civil proceedings against um, sub-postmasters and Crown Office employees, the conduct and behaviour of post office employees, senior executive and board members, the conduct of government, uh, the operation of the legal system and of the courts, and the process of seeking redress and accountability. Is that a fair summary? Yes. That all began, I think, with a coffee morning in your constituency on the 3rd of April 2009, is that right? Yes. Uh, and then I think you learned about the case of Joe Hamilton. I did. Your involvement continues, I think, to this day, not least because uh, you're a member of the Horizon Compensation Advisory Board. That's right. As I've said, your first involvement came about, I think, by reason of uh, being told about Joe Hamilton's case. Yes, it did. And I think you also learned about um, an article that was being written. It hadn't uh, yet been published, but it was being written by Rebecca Thompson of Computer Weekly. Is that right? Yes. And I think you um, tell us that um, you already held that publication in high regard because of some 
um, uh, previous involvement in uh, some work that it had done? Yes, the Chinook crash on the Mull of Kintar. And then later in 2009, you learned about a second case, that of David Bristow, the former sub-postmaster in Odiham. Is that right? That's right. Uh, his contract was terminated by the post office by reason of an alleged shortfall of £42,000. He suggested that the Horizon system was responsible for the shortfall. Is that Did a fair you? summary? Yes. Now, as well as lots of liaison with those um, who had drawn your attention to those two cases, Joe Hamilton's and Mr. Bristow's, and liaison over permission to use the information uh, that you had been given. I've seen all of the correspondence where you sought such permission. Would it be right that the first significant step that you took was to write to Lord Peter Mandelson, who was then the Secretary of State for uh, Business Innovation and Skills? Yes, that's correct. Can we look at that first significant step then? Um, the document will come up on the screen. It's poll 20114298. And it's uh, page nine. And if we can just um, enlarge so we can see the text. Thank you. Uh, you write on the 9th of November, sorry, on the 3rd of November 2009 to um, uh, Lord Peter Mandelson, the Secretary of State for Business Innovation and Skills, sometimes known as um, uh, BIS. You say um, that you enclosed two emails that you've received from a constituent, um, uh, uh, Mr. David Bristow, you give his address. I'm not gonna show you those emails for the moment, it's not necessary. Um, you note that a PQ raised by a Brooks uh, Newmark MP on the 12th of October and the reply um, of the 13th of October 2009 from Alan Cook, the MD of the Post Office. And then you say this, nonetheless, there does appear to be a significant number of postmasters and postmistresses accused of fraud who claim that the Horizon system is responsible, including at least two in my constituency. Given the level of impact this has had on the personal lives of these postmasters and postmistresses and their families, often involving bankruptcy and certainly significant financial hardship, I should be most grateful if you would let me have your comments on what can be done to investigate um, the matter. So this is, um, to put this in context, you as an opposition MP at this time? Yes, I was. Writing to the then Secretary of State drawing his attention directly to the suggestion that Horizon was responsible for shortfalls which were being laid at the door of sub-postmasters by accusations against them of fraud. Yes. And why were you writing, may I ask, to the government rather than to the post office who, who ran this, this Horizon system? Uh, because the government owned the post office. I think you followed um, this up with a chaser, if we look at page um, three of the pack here, same clip, and if we can just um, expand that a little bit. So we're now on the 10th of December 2009, but you write to Lord Mandelson again, saying, I write further to my letter of the 3rd of November, uh, regarding correspondence received from David Bristow. I enclose a copy of my previous letters and the two emails to which it refers. I also enclose two subsequent emails from Mr. Bristow and an email from a local councillor, um, John Kennett, describing the circumstances of the second post office in my constituency affected by the Horizon system, Joe Hamilton of the South, South Warmbra uh, post office in Hampshire. I've not yet received a reply and should be most grateful if you'd let me have your comments on the matter. I also request reassurance that BIS, that's Business Innovation and Skills, the department, will investigate this matter fully and take action as and where appropriate. 
given the urgency of Mr. Bristow's situation, I'd ask for your attention as soon as possible and a response by way of letter or, if preferred, um, a meeting. So you were asking here that the um, Department for Business Innovation and Skills should investigate the matter. Again, um, may I ask, why were you asking the Department to look into the matter rather than asking the Secretary of State to ask the Post Office to look into the Post Office? I was not hugely interested in the intricacies of who was responsible for what. I just wanted, to, wanted it sorted out, and I thought I might as well write to the person who owned it, which was, who was Peter Mandelson. Now, in the meantime, um, it seems that a letter had been drafted and perhaps even sent um, by way of reply to your first letter. If we can look at that, please. Um, UKGI 3011506. You'll, um, you'll see that this is dated the 5th of December 2009. And presumably this hadn't been received by you by the time you'd sent your letter of the 10th of December. Presumably. You will see if we just scroll to the bottom, please. It's sent by the minister, uh, Pat McFadden, uh, rather than the Secretary of State, uh, Lord Mandelson. And then if we go um, to the body of the letter, please. He thanks you for the uh, letter of the 3rd of November and says he's replying as the Minister of State for Business Innovation and Skills. And he says, quote, under the government's postal sector reforms introduced in 2001, Royal Mail, which includes Post Office Limited, was given greater commercial freedom as the management and unions had requested and government had assumed, has assumed an arm's length role as a shareholder in a public limited company. Subject to agreeing its strategic plan with us, the board can structure the business as it um, decides best to meet the challenges of market development and changing customer needs. The issues raised by your constituent are operational and contractual matters for the post office and not for government. I understand from the post office that errors at the branch have been fully investigated and there's nothing to indicate that there are any problems with the Horizon system. The company's position as regards the integrity of the Horizon system remains as set out in the reply from uh, Alan Cook to which your letter um, refers. Uh, you'll see that in the second paragraph there, Mr. Par uh, Mr. McFadden uh, uh, took the point or um, took the line that the government had assumed an arm's length role as the shareholder with the post office and that the in the third paragraph, that the issues raised by you, which included that a large number of people may have been wrongly accused of crimes when in fact Horizon was to blame, was not a matter for the government. Yes. What was your um, reaction, if any, to uh, those points? I was frustrated and annoyed, but it was clear that the government was saying that it was really nothing to do with them. And I didn't see at that stage where I could take it. Um, what, why were you frustrated? Because I'd wanted what had seemed to me to be something that was potentially an injustice to be sorted out. And since the government owned the post office, I assumed that the government would be in a position to sort it out, but they were saying, no, not me, Gov. It, you tell us in your witness statement that notwithstanding the frustration that you felt at the time, it didn't then occur to you quite how troubling the reply was. Yes. Can you explain what you mean by that? Um, yes. What this arm's length arrangement essentially means is that the government is refusing to take the responsibilities that go with ownership. Um, 
and I don't think it's right to do that for various reasons. One reason is that uh, if you have an organization that is as important to the community as the post office is, then the people have got to be uh, able to have proper control over it if the people own it. And there's a sort of democratic deficit that is popping up here if the government is refusing to take responsibility for it. And, and also, I know that uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Henry has been talking about the, uh, the risks of owning a dangerous dog. You cannot say that uh, the dangerous dog has an arm's length relationship with you. Uh, if you, uh, if the dangerous dog behaves badly. Uh, so the whole process of arm's length control is a worrying one, it seems to me. And that can come down, thank you. Um, much later on in um, the chronology, um, and this is paragraph 106 of your witness statement, you say that after the publication of the second site interim report of July 2013, the then Minister Joe Swinson, um, in the event, decided to make a statement in which she again emphasised the arm's length nature of the relationship between the post office and its owner, um, the government. Um, I think you say that in your view that was essentially the same position being taken um, as we see in this letter here in 2009. Yes. Uh, I don't know when this arm's length arrangement started, but it was one that moved from the Labour government to the coalition government and carried on into the subsequent Conservative government, yes. Can we turn um, to 2011 and early 2012, please? I'm going to skip over some other events, um, in particular your meetings with um, Joe Hamilton and with um, David Bristow, um, a meeting and correspondence with Ed Davey in 2011, uh, the BBC Inside Out piece presented by Nick Wallace and your conversation with Alice Perkins at a conference um, at Ditchley Park. And instead, uh, may I pick up the narrative, please, with letters that you wrote to Moya Green, the then Chief Executive of Royal Mail Group, and again to Ed Davey, the then Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for Business Innovation and Skills. Can we start with the letter to Moya Green um, and a reply that you got from Paula Venels, then Managing Director of Post Office Limited. So let's start with your letter. Um, poll 0010-5483. Again, if we can blow that up a little bit, please. Um, this is you writing on the 15th of December 2011 um, to Moyle Green, the Chief Executive of Royal Mail Group PLC. And you say, um, I have been contacted by a number of constituencies living in Odiham in Hampshire who are most upset by the fact their local post office has been closed and that a long-standing employee, Paul Kemp, has been dismissed um, due to um, irregularities. And just stopping there... You're referring there, I think, to a second sub-postmaster who had replaced Mr. Bristow, who had himself, in turn, been dismissed from the Odium branch. Precisely. Mr. Kemp did not himself approach me, but my constituents in Odium did, because they were worried about losing the post office in Odium. And I think you, you tell us in your statement that this gave rise to a number of concerns that... In particular, you considered that it could not simply be a coincidence that two sub-postmasters in um, quick succession at the same branch would be dismissed by the post office over alleged shortfalls. As well as the sub-postmistress in the next-door village of South Warnborough. Actually, there was, there was something at the back of my mind 
which continued to trouble me, which was the number of these people who were being told, you are the only person this is happening to. And that struck me as being profoundly wrong, because at first it was obviously disprovable. They were not the only people it was happening to. Second, it was isolating those sub-postmasters and sub-postmistresses so they could not get support from others in the same position. And third, it had an element of intimidation about it, all of which set the post office and its way of operating with its sub-postmasters in a bad light. And that was at the back of my mind, even though I didn't put that in this letter. I, I've skipped over your meetings with Mr. Bristow and Joe Hamilton. You tell us in your witness statement that at a personal level, in the light of seeing them face to face, which is what you had done, you formed a view of them, that they were transparently um, honest people with integrity. Yes, absolutely. And that in your judgment, it was vanishingly unlikely that they were uh, the um, type of people who would have done what was alleged against them. Yes, completely. Carrying on, you say, um, I'm most concerned on a number of fronts. Um, first, my uh, constituents tell me that this case appears to be a continuation of the problem that post office employees have been having with the software system that reconciled takings. I'm aware of 34 individual employees throughout the country who feel they have been wrongly accused of fraud due to faults with this particular system and a meeting with them in the new year to discuss what action they plan on taking. You may recall that this case was brought to my attention in 2008, I think that should actually be 2009, uh, when the sub-postmistress from South Warnborough, that's Joe Hamilton, in Hampshire faced the same situation. It's not been rectified, a situation which does not bring credit to the Royal Mail. Uh, I'm also writing to the Minister to make him aware of this, and we'll look at that in a moment. And then you deal with a separate point about the closure of the, the branch in Odeham. Uh, overall, in this letter, you were raising the horizon issue, not just in the context of the Odeham post office, but a much, as, mu as a much broader point. Would that be fair? Yes. Can we look at the reply, please? Uh, poll 0010 7698. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your letter of the 15th of December addressed to Moya Green. That's the one we've just looked at. As Managing Director of Post Office Limited, Moya has asked me to reply to you direct. And if we look at the foot of the page, um, sorry, over the page, we can see that it's um, a letter from Paula Venels. Yes. And then back to page one. So 9th of January, Paula Venels is writing back to you. The first page of this letter is about the last paragraph of your letter about the opening and closing of uh, the branch in Odium. So I'm going to skip over all of that because it's about whether and in what circumstances there should or should not be a post office at Odium. And then over the page, um, Ms. Venels addresses the wider issue that you raised. Turning to your more general comments about the Horizon system, we handle large sums of public money as well as the money entrusted to us by the 20 million people who visit our 11,500 branches each week. There are a small number of previous and existing sub-postmasters, including Mrs. Hamilton, who used to run the South Warnborough Post Office, who allege that financial discrepancies at their branch are due to a fault with the system. We're also aware of the activities of a group called Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance, JFSA. There's been no evidence to support any of the allegations, and we have no reason to doubt the integrity of the system, which we remain confident is robust and fit for purpose. 
um, she hopes that that has clarified the position. You um, described this um, in your witness statement as being given the brush off. Yes. You say in your witness statement that the sub-postmasters that you had met seemed to you to be transparently honest. Yes. That um, there was no suggestion that the introduction of a new computerized accounting system had thereby uncovered previously hidden fraudsters. No. And if anyone had made such a suggestion, you would have given it short shrift because of the self-evident um, honesty of the sub-postmasters you had met because of the sudden rash of similar allegations shortly after the installation of a new computer system. Yes. And therefore, you were not satisfied with being given the brush off by Paula Venels. No, I wasn't. Uh, can we turn to the letter to government that you wrote to Ed Davey, UKGI 401395? Um, you'll see he was the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State um, in Biz at that time. And you say, I have been contacted by a number of constituents living in Odium in Hampshire who are most upset at the fact that their local post office has been closed. And a, local, a long standing employee, Paul Kemp, has been dismissed due to irregularities. I'd be most grateful if you would look into these matters, these related matters, a matter of urgency. We discussed the matter some months ago. I'm most concerned that the irregularities may be a continuation of the problem that post office employees have been having with the software system that reconciled takings. I'm aware of 34 individual employees throughout the country who feel they've been wrongly accused of fraud due to faults in this particular system. Uh, you say that it's um, a situation that's not been rectified <coughs> a situation which does not bring, bring credit to the Royal Mail, and you note that you're writing to Moyer Green. And then you take up the point in the last paragraph about the closure of the post office, irrespective of the other issues that you raised. So in this letter, uh, would you agree you're drawing attention to the suggestion that Horizon is to blame for the losses that are being laid at the door of the sub-postmasters? Yes. You're uh, making it clear, would you agree, that this is a country-wide issue? Yes. And you refer to your previous correspondence. Um, did Mr. Davey ever reply to you? Um, I don't think he did, but I, refer, I referred in this letter not only to my previous correspondence, but also to a face-to-face -face discussion at the top of the second paragraph that I'd had some time before uh, when I must have raised it with him. But I don't think he replied to me, probably because uh, he was told that uh, Paula Venels was replying to me herself. I'm going to skip over um, the meeting, um, the early meeting between, that can come down, thank you, between sub-postmasters, um, Shoesmith solicitors, and parliamentarians in Port Cullis House yep. on the 27th of February 2012. Um, that's addressed in paragraphs 37 and 38 of your witness statement, um, and in um, detailed minutes of that meeting. Uh, there's no need to display this, um, on SMIS 40247 at pages 4 to 7. But in short, you chaired the meeting. You yes. told the sub-postmasters that you did not believe that they were anything other than on honest. Yes. And that the post office's line, uh, as you described it, that there was nothing wrong with Horizon, was wholly implausible. Yes. Is that a fair summary of the meeting? It is. 
And what was the idea of the, the meeting between sub-postmasters, shoesmiths, and parliamentarians? One MP alone can't achieve much. But if there is a nationwide uh, issue, then getting more than one MP together makes for much greater effect, as we can see. This led, I think, to a meeting with um, Alice Perkins and Olwyn Lyons and you very shortly thereafter on the 13th of March 2012, is that right? Yes. And I want to explore, explore briefly with you a meeting that you had um, with Alice Perkins and Alwyn Lyons. Um, so the context, I think, for the meeting was a written um, communication, an email that you'd sent to Alice Perkins on the 23rd of February. If we can just look at that, please. Uh, poll 0010-5470. And if we look at the very bottom of page one, Uh, you say, on the 23rd of February, Dear Alice, you may remember that when we met, uh, last met at, I think, Ditchley Park, that's the conference that um, I mentioned earlier, I mentioned the issue of Horizon, the Horizon computer system in use at sub-post offices throughout the country, and I said I had a real concern about the way some of the sub-postmasters in and outside my constituency had been treated, then over the page, you have, have to skip. Thank you. May I please come and see you about it? I know it's the position of the post office, supported by the National Federation of Sub-Postmasters, though not by the Communication Workers' Union, that there's nothing wrong with Horizon. I'm deeply skeptical about this, and I hope I can persuade you to look afresh at the matter, rather than accepting there should be a closing of ranks around the computer. So you end this saying you're deeply skeptical about the post office's position. There's nothing wrong with Horizon. And the purpose of the meeting that you were seeking was to persuade her to look afresh at the matter. Is that yes. right? Yes. You say rather than accept her accepting that there should be a closing of ranks around the computer. Is that what you had thought had happened already? Yes, it was. Uh, that's what had happened. Uh, the system w was robust, we were told. You make a point in your witness statement about the use of that word, robust. Yes, it was clearly the line to take. There were lots of uh, people who were told to use this word, uh, which implied a sort of series of group thinking seminars, uh, which led to the use of language, which is very important. And that's what they chose, robust. And um, you were concerned, um, presumably, that that is what would continue to happen, a closing of ranks around the computer, if things were allowed to continue unabated? Yes. So can I turn then, with that context in mind, to the meeting itself, poll 0010, Five four eight one. It's the three of you. We can see from the top. You, Alice Perkins, and Alwyn Lyons. Paragraph one. You started the meeting by explaining why you were concerned about the Horizon system and the support that sub-postmasters receive from the business when they're faced with a discrepancy in their accounts. You told us about, uh, he said, uh, sorry, the minute says you told them about a recent meeting uh, with you and another eight MPs. That's the Portcullis House meeting that we mentioned. Yes. Uh, in which you had met some of the affected sub-postmasters and shoesmiths, their legal representatives. If we just scan through um, paragraph two, that's Olwyn Lyons speaking. 
paragraph three, Alice Perkins inviting you to visit the model office to see how Horizon works. You in paragraph four, making a counter proposal to come to Old Street, so offering to come to Old Street, but accompanied by a computer expert, possibly somebody from Computer Weekly and you made the point that you put credence on their opinion because of their involvement in the Chinook helicopter crash inquiry, and that you told them that Computer Weekly had also been sceptical about Horizon. And then paragraph five is something I just want to concentrate on. It says, um, it records, and this is the post office's own note, Alice Perkins explained that the system had been independently reviewed by several people, including the Royal Mail Internal Audit and Deloitte, who had no relationship with the business or Fujitsu. And you are recorded as saying that you were not convinced that this had been done by IT experts. From this minute, I suspect you, you've got no recollection of um, the meeting itself. You are correct. Uh, but from the minute, would you understand that you were being told that Royal Mail Group internal audit was independent of the post office? Yes, I would have been sceptical about that independence. And then secondly, that there was a separate audit of Horizon by Deloitte. Yes, because there was something inherently implausible about a new computer system being completely fault-free. Have you, um, to this date, ever seen um, such an independent audit of the Horizon system um, completed by Deloitte before the 13th of March 2012, when this um, meeting took place? No. Uh, we can see what um, paragraph six says. Alice Perkins offered to consider a further review of the system by an IT expert, looking at, specifically looking at the integrity of the um, data and discrepancy errors thrown up in sub-postmasters' balances. Uh, you said um, that the training uh, was not um, adequate. Which is a different point. Yes. Um, introduced the issue that the sub-postmaster's contract was over 100 pages long, written in 94 when Horizon was not in place and didn't explain the process for making good errors uh, clearly enough. That's, again, a separate point. Um, and you suggested that the sub-postmasters didn't get a copy of their contract until, after they had, until they had taken up their appointment, by which time it was too late to understand the full commitment they were making. And that's a, a yet fourth point, I think. And then um, we can see what's discussed in paragraphs 8 and 9, and then over the page at 10, in closing, you informed Alice Perkins that there had been discussion about an adjournment debate on the topic. Is, um, what's the purpose of mentioning that kind of thing? Oh, well, just to say that it if there were eight MPs involved in the meeting with shoesmiths and sub-postmasters, then raising it in Parliament would be a good way of bringing publicity and ministerial attention to an issue that was clearly important. So it, is it a sort of a, an attempt to drive action by yes. the post office? Yes, it must have been. Not that I'd ever done an a German debate by that stage, but nevertheless, I suppose that was what I was doing, yes. I.e., this needs to be taken seriously. Uh, yes. One of the consequences, if it's not, may be in a German debate. Precisely. Uh, can we um, uh, look, please, uh, as matters, um, and I'm dealing with this uh, part of the chronology in some detail because it, it may be important in due course, um, at a letter um, of the 4th of April, um, that in fact you weren't copied into, but 
Um, can we look, please, at poll 0010 7710. Thank you. And if we just look at the second page, please, we can see it's from Paula Venels. Yes. And then back to the first page. Uh, it's a letter to Oliver Lettwin of the 4th of April, 2012. And I, I just want to see whether this, what is being said by Miss Venels here, is reflective of the kind of thing that Miss Venels and other senior executives at the post office were saying to you at this time in the spring of 2012. Um, uh, Oliver Letwin, just for context, was one of the MPs um, who was amongst the group who was seeking to pursue this matter in the same way as you. Yes. Uh, Ms. Venel says, um, Dear Oliver, I understand you raised a query on the robustness of the post office horizon system yesterday with Moya Green. I'm grateful to Moya for passing this query on to me. And then Ms. Venel says this, the post office takes very seriously any perception that there is an issue with the accuracy of the horizon system, there isn't. The horizon system has been rigorously tested using independent assessors and robust um, procedures. The, the independent assessors point, is that um, the kind of thing that was ever said to you? Oh, probably. Although, I, I mean, I can't remember the words being used, but probably if that was what they were saying. To were, were they ever named? I mean, we saw in the meeting that it was said that there was an independent audit commissioned uh, or carried out by the Royal Mail Group's audit function and Deloitte's. Um, these independent assessors, can you remember whether any other names were given? Well, it's 12 years ago now. I can't remember whether names were used. Um, it was the independence that I would have been interested in rather than the, than the, the names. Yes. And we'll see that there's a very firm line taken in the first part of that paragraph. Yes. Seems just seems odd. And then paragraph three. Uh, Therefore, when queries are raised, my team will work with the sub-postmasters to help to identify the problem. Very often the missing in inverted commas funds are uh, a keying or balancing error. Uh, that can be put right and training given to ensure it doesn't happen again. Uh, these checks and procedures resolve virtually all discrepancies satisfactorily. So, so that's saying it's the sub-postmaster's responsibilities or fault, essentially. Yes. However, in some cases, which fortunately are very few and far between, we've had to prosecute sub-postmasters for theft or false accounting and provide evidence which substantiates our legal position. Um, in every instance, the courts have found in our favour now, um, that's a false statement there, that in every instance the courts have found in our favour. It's just not true. Did, would you have known at the time that that was a false statement? No, I wouldn't. Would you, um, if the a senior executive at the post office was writing to you on um, post office headed paper and formally as an MP and said, in every instance, the courts have found in our favour, except at face value what they were saying? Yes, I would. I would expect public officials, as Paul Venels was, to tell the truth. Um, however, I would have had, at the back of my mind, the knowledge that the post office had been, as a matter of almost routine, telling lots and lots and lots of sub-postmasters 
that they were the only ones having these problems. That would have been at the back of my mind, I think. So I might have had some question about what they were saying. Thank you. That can come down. I'm going to skip over the meeting that you and Oliver Letwin had with um, Alice Perkins, the chairman of the post office, Paula Venels, the then CEO of the post office, Susan Crichton, the legal and compliance director, Leslie Sewell, the chief information officer, Rod Ismay, then head of product and branch accounting, and Angela Vanden Bogart, the head of network on the 17th of May. It's addressed in detail in paragraphs 43 to 46 of your witness statement and in a comprehensive pack prepared for the meeting. The outcome of the meeting, is this right, was that the post office offered to give independent forensic accountants access to the Horizon system and for the post office to fund such an investigation? Yes. It was the first time I had heard the phrase forensic accountants. I didn't, I didn't know what they were, but it sounded good. Um, and uh, it turned out to be good. This, I think, had been something that had been suggested by Andrew Tyree MP back in the Portcullis House meeting of the 27th of uh, February 2012. Yes. And so I think you were pleased. Yes, very pleased. Partly because uh, the offer came from Paula Venels, uh, namely to have the forensic accountants. Um, it was something that uh, we wanted, but when Paula Venels offered it, we bit her hand off, as it were. I just want to ask you for uh, some details about what the post office said through its senior representatives that it was proposing uh, these forensic accountants should um, investigate so that we can see and we can compare what was proposed with what we ended up with yes. at the end of the second site um, investigation. Uh, can we look please at poll 303 3825? Um, this is something that I don't think you would have seen. Um, it's a post office pack containing um, the documents set out in that index there, an agenda for the meeting, key messages that the post office wished to deliver. I think I saw this when I was asked to draft my witness statement. Yes. yes. You wouldn't have seen it at the time. I, I certainly didn't see it at the time. So they're essentially, I think, speaking notes in large part for the meeting. And can we um, turn to page three, please? Uh, we can see the key messages to be delivered by Alice Perkins under the WHO column in the introductions to the meeting. Um, thank you for coming today. The people around the table are we, un we understand you've raised some concerns. Uh, we take this issue very seriously. The, this impacts the lives of individuals, public money's at stake, so is our reputation. We're open to feedback. We'll provide you the information we have available. Our aim is to be um, open and transparent. Uh, we're hoping you'll find uh, that we're handling these issues openly and fairly would like your advice as to how we best approach those who are skeptical. Uh, we're constantly looking at ways of improving our IT systems and support we give. And then this, our IT systems are routinely audited and our recruitment and training processes are independently reviewed so that we can make um, improvements Uh, we'll be exploring in due course the accuracy of, of that um, IT systems being routinely audited. And then reading on, we're also considering an external audit of our end-to-end -end processes, systems and data. I'll come back to you um, at the end of the meeting to get your views. 
is that the, the offer, we'll come back to the later minute in a moment, uh, that you were pleased about, an external audit of our end to, uh, of our end to the processes, systems and data? No. I think that came later in the meeting. This was the introductory spiel. Um, and so I think the key messages involving the appointment of an independent forensic accountant came later. Um, just skipping through, um, we'll get to the end in a moment. Um, page five, please. Um, this is um, uh, Leslie Sewell speaking, third bullet point, although we recognize um, that Horizon is not perfect, no computer system is, it's been audited by internal and external teams. It's also been tested in the courts and no evidence of problems found of the nature suggested by JFSA. And Horizon was designed with integrity in mind from the very beginning. And then if we... Uh, go on, please, to page seven. I think this is where um, Alice Perkins wraps up, where she comes back, as she promised to do, as we saw on that first page. Um, second bullet point in the bottom box, we're also considering commissioning an independent audit as an assurance measure. But in I the think light... That was, that was the one. Yeah, but in the... Um, in light of the fact that there is no evidence that there is a problem, we need to determine if this is a good use of public money. What are your thoughts? And presumably you bit the hand off. Yes. What did you understand was being offered? That there would be an independent deep dive into what had gone wrong with these sub-postmasters who had been prosecuted or made to pay money. Um, and that was exactly what uh, Andrew Tari had suggested and what we needed, that uh, somebody other than the post office would be looking into the workings of Horizon. So that would involve, would this be right, looking at Horizon as an entire system, uh, the end-to-end -end process involved, yes, as, as well as other post office accounting procedures? Yes. Uh, one of the things that I had raised in one of the documents you've earlier, earlier shown me was the issue of the helpline, the issue of training, the issue of the contract, um, and... So, yes, to look into all of that. It seems that there was an agreement to have a further meeting with a wider group of parliamentarians, and that was set for the 18th of June, 2012. Yes. Um, this is uh, maybe quite an important meeting, so I want to examine it in a little more detail, if we may. Uh, can we look, please, at JARB 601? I think um, these minutes were taken, is this right, by Janet Walker, your then uh, Chief of Staff? Yes, that's correct. And we'll see that there are six MPs present, including you and Mr. Letwin, plus representatives from three other MPs. Yes. So uh, nine MPs in total, either present or represented. Yes. And then four post office um, uh, uh, people present, uh, Miss Perkins, Venels, Van den Bogard, and um, Lyons. Yes. And then scroll down, please. You introduced the meeting, which was limited to MPs and the post office personnel only. Uh, the issue of problems reported with the Horizon system has given rise to controversy 
dating back a number of years. Many MPs, constituents, have been prosecuted for false accounting, theft and fraud, many protesting their innocence. Meeting was convened in February at the House of Commons, attended by MPs and their constituents, at which this matter was discussed. That's a cross-reference to the 27th of February meeting at Portcullis House. Yes. Following this meeting, um, you had several private meetings with Ms. Perkins and her colleagues to discuss how the issue might best be approached and resolved. And that's a cross-reference to the meetings that we've just looked at. Yes. Um, Alice Perkins gave background information and the post office's perspective and introduced um, her colleagues. Um, post Office Limited is now a completely separate entity from the Royal Mail. She arrived at the organisation in August 2011 and became aware of the issue soon after starting. She emphasised the matter was a very serious one for the Post Office, whose business rests on its reputation as being trustworthy. She said the Post Office also recognised full well that the matter was also very serious for the sub-postmasters and mistresses involved, as it was invariably life-changing. So, so far, so good, I think. Yes. And then over the page, please. She said uh, that now was a time of enormous change at the post office and that it was important to give MPs confidence in the business and its reputation. Um, again, I think so far, so good. Um, she said, she stated that the matter involved treading a tightrope regarding questions of money. The post office and its staff are stewards of large quantities of cash the cash does not belong to the post office. It's in transit as it comes through the post office. There is the issue of trying not to put temptation in people's way, but in any retail business that is not possible. But what um, did you or do you understand uh, to be the point being made there about temptation being put in people's way? At the meeting of the 17th of May, uh, with Oliver Letwin and me, Alice Perkins and Paula Vanels had both raised the problem of there being lots and lots of cash lying around in unexpected places. And uh, whether this meant that they thought that that led sub-postmasters into temptation and being inherently dishonest wasn't entirely clear, but that was the issue that they were raising, I think. Um, and we never really got to the bottom of that, but that's what she was talking about. We then see that um, Miss Venels picks up the temptation baton and says, um, she said that temptation is an issue, uh, but that trust in the post office as a brand is absolutely paramount post office needs competent, trustworthy people on staff, um, and its processes and systems must be transparent and must work well. So again, at the moment, the focus, I think, is all on the honesty and trustworthiness of the postmasters. Yes. Um, of the 11,800 sub-postmasters and mistresses currently employed, only a tiny number are presenting as cases where there's an issue of alleged fraud involving the Horizon system. The problem, therefore, is um, relatively very small. And then I want to go through what's later said here as a series of um, assertions made. She said, according to the minutes, that the Horizon system is very secure. Um, the first assertion, assertion one. Did you at this stage know whether that was true or false? At this stage, no, I didn't. Uh, we were going to have an independent investigation to see whether that was true or not. Did you accept what you were being told by the chief executive of the post office? I did not accept that the Horizon system was very secure, no. That was a matter still to be investigated. Can I turn to the second assertion? Assertion two, every keystroke used by anyone using the system is recorded and auditable. Did you know whether that was true or false? 
I didn't know whether that was true or, true or false. That was a matter still to be investigated. Did you accept what you were being told by the chief executive of the post no. office? That she's recorded as continuing to say, when things go wrong in a sub post uh, office, there's a helpline which staff can call seven days a week during office hours and back up staff who will um, help further if things go wrong. It's here that issues are normally resolved. Did you know whether that was um, correct, true or false, uh, that at the helpline stage, issues are normally resolved? I believed it was probably untrue at that stage, mostly because of the experience that Joe Hamilton had had of seeing, uh, of telephoning the helpline, asking what to do, doing what they said, and seeing the balance that she was alleged to be owing to have doubled in front of her eyes. So that assertion struck me as being untrue. Uh, can we turn to the fourth assertion? It appears that some sub-postmasters have been borrowing money from the post office account or till in the same way that they might do in a retail business. But this isn't how the post office works. Post office cash is public money and the post office must recover it if it goes uh, missing. Uh, did you or would you take from um, what is recorded as being said there that the issue, according to Ms. Venels, was with postmasters putting their hands in the till rather than with Horizon? Well, it's clearly possible that that might have happened in some cases. But if you don't have a um, robust, to use the word, Horizon uh, accounting system, you can't be sure whether it has happened. So uh, I thought it might have happened in some cases, but to say that it happened in a lot of cases struck me as being needing to be examined and tested. And then the fifth assertion, every case taken to prosecution that involves the Horizon system thus far has found in favour of the post office, assertion five. Uh, we'll come in a moment to look at that statement, which, as I've said, is not um, a true statement. But did you know whether it was true or false at this time? Well, what I knew about Jo Hamilton was that her case had been found in favour of the post office, and yet it was her case that I was particularly questioning. So it may have been true, so far as I was aware, but I didn't, uh, I didn't place much credence in what she had said that. Can we go to the foot of the page, please? You'll see just in between that the minute follows um, largely the uh, structure of the speaking notes that we've looked at with Angela Van den Bogard now um, speaking to the two case studies. Um, it, it notes there that they're attached. Do you think you might have got something um, from that pack that we saw? Well, they were attached. Uh, I, I think I did see some case notes, yes. They are somewhere around in a large bundle of papers. Thank you. Uh, if we go to the foot of the page, uh, Mike Wood MP um, asked the question that, um, to which an answer is given later. So we should look at the question um, as a whole now. Mike Wood MP asked whether anyone at the post office had entertained the thought that there might well be problems with the Horizon system rather than believing that there was not. He asked whether the post office was saying that the system was 100% secure and 100% foolproof, making the point that it would be the first software system implemented by government to be so were this the case. And then if we um, go over to the top of the next page, Andrew Brigden MP um, asked whether there had been any case where the discrepancy was the fault of the system. Uh, there's then um, a discussion where it seems there was a, a, a 
uh, sidetracking about the um, identity of the forensic accountant. And then if you see three boxes from the bottom there, Paula Venels said that going back to and Andrew Brigden's question, there had not been a case investigated where the Horizon system had been found to be at fault. So there is a, then what I'm calling assertion six. Uh, did you know, um, again, it's expressed in a different way, whether that was true or false? No. That there had not been a case investigated where hori the Horizon system had been found to be at fault? No, I didn't. So we've seen uh, the assertions made. Uh, that can come down, thank you and the assurance is given to nine MPs and their rep all their representatives. Uh, would you agree overall this is a fair summary? The problem is that a small number of postmasters borrow money from the till. The problem is not Horizon. Every prosecution involving Horizon has found in favor of the post office and not a single case existed where on investigation the horizon system was found to be at fault? Yes. I think it follows that um, Alice Perkins, uh, Paula Venels, Angela Vanden Bogard, and Orwin Lyons did not disclose to you and the other eight MPs or their representatives the following. Firstly, anything about the Julie Wollstone home case? No, they didn't. In which expert evidence had been served by a man called Jason Coyne concerning bugs in the Horizon system and which case was subsequently settled by the post office. They didn't disclose that, no. They didn't mention the case of um, Lee Castleton and the obtaining of the a report from BDO Stoy Hayward, which had found errors in the operation of the Horizon system. No, they didn't. They didn't mention the acquittal of Maureen McKelvey by a jury in 2004, Mrs. McKelvey having blamed Horizon for the causing of losses of money which she was accused of stealing. No, they didn't. They did not mention the speedy acquittal of Suzanne Palmer by a jury in 2007, Mrs. Palmer also having blamed Horizon at trial for the losses attributable um, or said to be attributable to her. No, they didn't. A jury question directed at the post office to the effect of what is Mrs. Palmer supposed to do if she didn't agree the figure that Horizon had produced, which the post office had been unable or unwilling to answer, and an order that the post office pay uh, £78,000 in costs. No, they didn't. They didn't mention any of the following bugs, uh, all of which had been discovered and notified to the post office by this time. Uh, the calendar square bug, sometimes known as the Falkirk bug, operative by the post office's admission um, between 2000 and 2006 and on the findings later of Mr Justice Fraser until 2010. No, they didn't mention. They didn't mention the receipts and payments mismatch bug of 2010. No. Uh, the suspense account bug that was operative between uh, 2010 and 2013. No. They didn't mention the Dow Mellington bug operative from 2010 and the fact that it was still operative at the time of this meeting. No. They didn't mention the reming in bug operative in 2010 or the reming out bugs operative in 2005 and again in 2007. No. They didn't mention the local suspense account bug operative in 2010. No. The reversals bug operative in 2003. No. The gyro bank discrepancy bugs operative in 2000, 2001 and 2002. No. They didn't mention that consideration had been given to the commissioning of an independent expert review and report on Horizon in December 2005 and again in March 2010, but that on each occasion the post office, post office had decided against it, on the latter occasion seemingly on the grounds that it might be disclosable in criminal proceedings. They didn't mention that. They didn't mention problems with the so-called ARQ data and whether those issues should be revealed to criminal courts who are cri hearing criminal charges against sub-postmasters based on ARQ data 
and of which the post office had been notified? No. Does it follow that your state of knowledge at this time based on what the post office board member and executive members were telling you, was that you were unaware of any bugs, errors, or defects which had been detected in Legacy Horizon or which were um, then evident and emerging in Horizon Online? Yes, I was unaware. I think we were all unaware. But Mike Wood was raising the question, is this the only uh, absolutely perfect computer program in existence. Uh, you were unaware of the problems with the uh, so-called ARQ data and I its was. presentation to criminal courts? Yes, completely unaware of that. So that's an appropriate, appropriate moment um, if um, it's convenient to you uh, to break in this line of questioning. Certainly, uh, Mr. Beer. Uh, I'll just ask you, Lord Arbuthnot, if I may. We reached the summer of 2012, and it may be that um, Mr. Beer will pursue this further, but just so that it's, now that it's stuck in my mind, can I ask you this? In any of these discussions, um, was the role of Fujitsu mentioned at all? Um, it's hard to remember precisely when Fujitsu's role came up. Certainly it was raised at some stage, and I believe it had been raised before now, yes. Right. Um, uh, but I can't remember exactly when it was first raised. But were you given a kind of um, summary, for want of a better description, of the role that Fujitsu might be playing in um, uh, providing information uh, which permitted the post office either to prosecute or um, uh, take disciplinary action against sub-postmasters? No, I don't think I was. Not at this stage. Fine. I uh, then I, w I won't ask you anymore. And if Mr. Beer wants to take it up, then he may. But... But I was just conscious that in the documents we looked at, which may only, of course, be a small representative sample, there was no reference to Fujitsu. So I just wanted what your memory was about it. Thank you. What time shall we start again, uh, Mr. Beer? Can we say half past, please? Yeah, of course.
So, good morning. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, Lord Arbuthnot, in my list of um, 16 or 17 things that um, were not uh, mentioned to you, against being told that every prosecution involving Horizon had found in favour of the post office and that not a single case existed where on investigation the Horizon system was found to be at fault, um, I omitted to include one. Um, uh, that of uh, Mrs. Nicola Arch, Miss Nicola Arch, who was acquitted in 2000, so very early on. Um, was that something that was mentioned to you? No, that was not something that was mentioned to me. Um, I had, had mentioned the jury acquittal in 2004 of Maureen McKelvey and the jury acquittal of Suzanne Palmer in 2007. Um, that's a third jury acquittal not mentioned. Right. And in that list of um, 16, now 17 um, issues um, that were not revealed to you uh, at the meeting that we were talking about in mid-June, does the same apply to all of the meetings that you had with senior post office managers? And by that I mean the meeting with Alice Perkins and Alwyn Lyons on the 13th of March 2012? Oh yes, the, the same applies. I was, I was not told. Uh, here is a list of bugs that you ought to take into account. No, they failed to fail to do that. And I, I might divide it into three. W one is um, civil and criminal cases. Um, the second is bugs, and the third is consideration in the past of past. In, um, of independent investigations. Absolutely. They did not do that. And does the same apply to the meeting with Alice Perkins and Paula Venels on the 17th of May 2002? Yes. Uh, in um, all of this time, um, did um, any of them ever mention the facts and matters which I've listed, 16 or 17 of them? No. Now, um, at this, um, or in preparation for this meeting of the 18th of June 2012, um, there was also a prac prepared, um, just like the last meeting, the 17th of May 2012, um, by the post office. And I just want to look at some of the things that the senior representatives of the post office were intending to say, or were brief to say, as opposed to what the minute records them as actually having said. Can we look at poll? Three zero nine six six four zero. Can you see this is um, in similar format, a pack for the 18th of June meeting? Yes. And can we go to page four, please? Um, this is um, the part that sets out the Paul of Venel's um, briefing note, speaking note, or lines to take. And can we look at the fifth bullet point, please? Uh, where she is uh, briefed to say, or um, to include in the meeting, I am confident about the integrity of Horizon. It was built on robust principles of reliability and integrity. Um, it has undergone many external audits and no problems of this nature have ever been raised. And then on a technical level, one, an audit trail is created for each transaction, which means we can look at all transactions done at the counter and see what happens to them subsequently. Each transaction is protected with a digital signature to prevent change or tampering, which means that if someone was able to penetrate the many layers of security, they wouldn't be able to unlock the seal that protects the transaction. This prevents any malicious manipulation and reconciliation processes automatically detect any problems, which mean if there is a problem, deliberate or otherwise, it will be caught on the reconciliation report. 
uh, did you or would you take such a statement to mean that remote access to alter the branch accounts was not possible? I would have taken that to mean that, yes. The, thank you, that can come down. The conclusion of the um, uh, meeting uh, was uh, that uh, an independent review or investigation should be undertaken. Yes. You address in your witness statement uh, and the documents exhibited to it the process by which Second Sight came to be um, appointed. And can I just summarise and see whether this is correct, please? Um, firstly, Second Sight um, was identified by Susan Crichton of the Post Office, and that was because she had a previous connection with Ron um, Warmington at GE Capital. Yes. Um, it was identified that it was necessary for um, relevant MPs and the sub-postmaster community, including Alan Bates, who was by now undertaking a leading role in representing some of the sub-postmasters, to be satisfied as to the competence and independence of Second Sight. Yes. And therefore, meetings took place, um, firstly, on the uh, 4th of July 2012, between Second Sight and five MPs, including you, which was a, essentially a species of vetting interview. Yes. Secondly, on the 12th of July 2012, between Second Sight, you, Alan Bates, and Kay Linnell, a forensic accountant. Yes. And then there was a series of um, exchanges of correspondence between you and Alan Bates, which I'm not going to address. But is the long and the short of it that um, MPs through your offices started to send cases to individual cases to second sight after their appointment? Yes, and it, although it may have been via me or my office, probably was. And so you were um, a, a hub? I was. Uh, for the forwarding of such cases? Yes. Um, I think it's right that your office didn't vet or decide which cases should go forward or not. No, we would have been in no position to do so. Can I turn to some early reporting back um, from Second Sight? I think it's right that in March 2013 you received some early feedback from Second Sight on the investigations that had by then taken place. And this caused the meeting to be scheduled for the 25th of March 2013 at Port Cullis House. Um, in advance, you wrote a letter to Alice Perkins on the 7th of March, 2013, and I'd like to look at that, please. Uh, poll 309 So 7th of March, 2013, you to Alice Perkins. And if we can blow up the text, please. As you know, I'm hosting a meeting on the 25th of March at Portcullis House about the sub-postmaster mistress issue. That's the meeting that we're going to turn to. Um, the meeting is to take the form of an update from Ron Warmington and Ian Henderson of Second Sight on how their investigations are proceeding. I wonder if you might be free to attend along with any of those of your colleagues that you deem it's appropriate to invite. I've invited all MPs who have constituents who've raised this matter with them. Alan Bates, who heads the Alliance for uh, Justice of Sub Postmasters, and Kay Linnell, who is working with him. I do not propose inviting uh, the media. And then we can scan over the... Um, remaining paragraphs on that page. And go over the page, please. If we look, um, you say at the top of the page, I'd like to raise two matters, and uh, these are things that may need a conversation between you and me. Uh, before the meeting, in my discussions with Ron and Ian, I gather that questions have been raised over the absolute integrity of Horizon. 
though without their being so fundamental as to say that the system is not fit for purpose. Since it is a system that remains in current use, there's a risk that existing sub-postmasters and mistresses may find themselves in exactly the same position as those whose cases are being investigated. I know definitive results are not yet available, but I hope Post Office will be ready to um, address this issue. I think it follows from that that you um, had by that stage received information from Second Sight um, that questions over the absolute integrity of Horizon uh, were being raised by them, Second Sight. Yes. In the last well, paragraph. Not, necess not necessarily by them. Questions were being raised. Uh, at least in the presence of Second Sight, possibly by Second Sight, or possibly both. I understand. You say in the last paragraph um, that you're impressed beyond expectations with not only in how the investigations are proceeding, but of your continuing support. Uh, you could not recall a more important campaign, nor one where the end result has been so consistently supported by all parties involved. You have my gratitude and admiration for how the post office is handling this. You tell us in your witness statement that at the early stages of the um, second site investigation, you believed, and this is my summary, not yours, that the post office was entering into the enterprise in good faith. Yes. Did that remain your belief? By this stage, yes. By the time I wrote this letter, I certainly did believe that. We'll come later to the um, when seeds of doubt um, started to be sown. Yes. Um, uh, but can you identify in summary uh, uh, what those seeds were and when they occurred? The summary of the seeds of doubt arose through my initial fears about uh, the post office's approach to the truth in terms of telling uh, people like Joe Hamilton that you're the only person that was involved. But let's ride over that. There was a degree of uh, legal battlefield that arose. There was a degree of delay in providing second sight with uh, information. There was a de degree of delay in providing the documents that the post office had promised to give second sight, being absolutely open and transparent, and yet they weren't. There was a slowness, a secrecy, um, a general slowing everything down that worried me. I think it's right to say that the post office did not react well to this letter that you wrote. I think it is right to say that. Can we um, look at what you say about that in your witness statement, please, at page 42? Page 42, paragraph 80, please. Foot of the page. You say, my letter caused strong pushback from the post office. And on the 19th of March, there was a meeting between myself and Alice Perkins. It appears from a speaking note that Janet Walker, that's your chief of staff, wrote for me for a telephone call on the 20th of March between myself and Ian Henderson, that at the meeting of the 19th of March, over the page, Alice Perkins said, amongst other things, that the post office didn't believe anything was wrong with Horizon, that they were very concerned that any opinion being formed by Second Sight at this stage was being communicated, that Second Sight should not be expressing an opinion, not least as the post office hadn't had a right of reply that there was a limit to the post office's willingness to continue funding investigations, 
that it seemed that there would be some sort of deadline for cases of the end of February and that the post office would not attend the meeting of the 25th of March but there would be an open letter from the post office available for distribution at that meeting and that the post office would expect to be ready to attend a meeting with MPs in perhaps due. Lord Abuthnot, I don't um, understand. Can you help me? Um, I thought the post office had said they wanted their systems, processes and data independently assessed. Yes, with absolute openness and transparency. I didn't understand it either. I was a bit surprised because I thought my letter to uh, the post office of the 7th of March had been rather, rather a nice one. So. Um, they'd said that they were invested in securing the truth and that they wished to be open and transparent with sub-postmasters and with the public. And yet here was the chairman saying to you that the independent investigators should not communicate their opinions, that their funding may be withdrawn, and that they were pulling out of a meeting. Yes, which didn't sit well with the way that Second Sight had been appointed, which was almost a joint exercise between the post office and the MPs and the JFSA. And yet it seems that the post office was saying that second sight were not to talk to us which seemed to us to be odd and wrong so the meeting went ahead um without you uh, sorry with you with other mps with the jfsa and with second sight but without the post office yes and we've got your speaking notes for that meeting your chief of staff's minutes of that meeting and second, star, uh, second sight's speaking notes. I, I just want to look at um, the last of those, uh, which is JARB 5047. Uh, these are the um, second sight um, uh, notes uh, for um, the meeting of the 25th of March 2013. Uh, there is um, a, a summary in the first, second, third and fourth paragraphs. And then scroll down please. Then at the foot of the page they, Second Sight, recall that the fast-track review process had identified the following seven issues as being a significant feature in one or more of the cases submitted. Um, transaction anomalies following communications or power failures. Rogue transactions not entered by sub-postmasters or their staff. Missing or duplicated transactions associated with postage labels, phone cards, gyro payments, um, ATMs or checks, training and support issues, loss of transaction audit trails uh, being available to sub-postmasters, accounting issues at the end of tra the trading period, and the contract between the post office and um, sub-postmasters. And then if we go uh, over the page, please. They said the investigation is progressing well. A number of difficult issues have been satisfactorily resolved and an excellent working relationship has been established with both JFSA and Post Office. Second Sight has regular meetings with senior representatives of the Post Office and is grateful for the support the Post Office is providing. The investigation is complex and involves looking at events that occurred over a long period of time. In some cases seven or eight years were still at the evidence gathering stage, particularly for cases submitted in the last few weeks, too early for us to reach even preliminary conclusions on the matters under review. This is a fact-based investigation involving complex information technology. It's important to allow all relevant parties to submit um, evidence on the matters um, under review. 
the, the seven features that we saw on page one, did you understand these to be established or findings by Second Sight at that point? Or is that to be qualified by what's said in this penultimate paragraph here? I thought that they were things that required further work. Um, it seems that, in turn, what was said at the meeting um, caused um, concern with JFSA. And can we look, please, at Mr. Bates' letter of the 1st of April, 2013, um, JARB 5049. This is a letter to you from Mr. Bates. Uh, he says, um, having had the opportunity to reflect on the meeting at Port Cullis House, that's the one we're talking about, uh, I thought it important to convey to you the concerns that both Kayla and Ellen and I took from the second site report and the briefing document they <coughs> produced for the meeting. That's the one we've just looked at. Yes. Whilst every individual's case is extremely important to that individual, it's also doubly so in the weight that it adds to the systemic failures with post office and their horizon system. These are issues which we at JFSA have been raising for years. And having closely worked with Second Sight over the last few months, we can see that they too have independently arrived at the same conclusions through their analysis of the cases. We can neither understand why Second Sight was so reluctant to bring the systemic failures to the fore at the meeting, nor see why the focus of the investigation has uh, not now been centered on them. These systemic failures are proven facts. They're at the root of most of the sub-postmaster cases. Although from the second site briefing document, it seems that they are only going to be treated as an adjunct to the issue of the cases, to the point of where only the first three they list may be featured in their forthcoming report. The items I'm referring to from their document are, and then he lists the seven of them. We fully appreciate that more work has to be undertaken uh, to draw together the, the descriptions of each of the systemic failures recognized so far and the others known about, but for whatever reason not appearing on the list. Yet the work involved would be minor in comparison to laboring through the individual cases first. These systemic failures are also for others to comprehend without the re requirement um, of an in-depth knowledge of the finer points. Uh, these systemic failures should now become the yardstick that the individual cases are measured against. That approach will be quicker and far more um, effective method of addressing the whole issue and would minimize the information required from poll, which is the main cause of the slow progress of, um, that Second Sight has made with the individual cases. Uh, doesn't see, uh, there does seem to me far too much sensitivity in not requiring the post office to address these systemic failures now rather than waiting until a report is produced later in the year. In your um, estimation at the time, were these fair points that Mr. Bates was making? It, it was probably beyond my technical understanding of the way Horizon worked, but I thought that these were points which certainly needed to be answered both by Second Sight and by the post office. There was at some stage a dispute about the meaning of the word systemic and Second Sight used it eventually to mean a system-wide set of problems whereas Alan Bates was using it to mean a problem with the system, wherever it struck. Um, and the post office grabbed the, uh, grabbed the most favorable to them meaning of the word systemic, uh, and Alan Bates uh, uh, pursued the least favorable to the post office use of the word systemic. Did you gain any sense at this time of whether the post office's intervention by the letter from Alice Perkins and the refusal to attend the meeting, the, the strong pushback that you um, mentioned earlier, had itself had an effect on the strength of view 
that Second Sight held, or at least the way it was prepared to present such views? I'm not sure exactly what you're asking there. I did think that uh, this was the first time that the post office had really objected to what Second Sight was doing, and that might well have a consequence on Second Sight. Thank you. I think that answers the question. You had a telephone um, conference call with Paula Venels um, as a consequence of this, for which um, your chief of staff prepared a briefing or speaking note. Can we look at that, please? J-A-R-B 5052. Uh, the calls at the request of the post office following the meeting on the 25th of March. The post office is nervous that the MPs are wanting individual cases resolved rather than following the existing approach uh, taken by Second Sight. An earlier meeting with Alice Perkins demonstrated the concern the post office um, had been shown no evidence of problems with Horizon. Final paragraph of this note, Second Sight to Alan Bates, indicates that they may have found uh, something. I should have said that you tell us in your witness statement that um, you believe that the conversation with Paula Venables went much along the lines of this um, uh, briefing note. Uh, can we go to the second page, um, please? And uh, the foot of the page, please. So you're here um, uh, rehearsing, Mrs. Walker is rehearsing for you, the contents of an email exchange between them and um, Alan Bates uh, under paragraph two. Uh, you've mentioned, quote, numerous miscarriages of justice, and it's pretty clear that James has also focused on that, as has Poles, post offices, top management. UK, Ian and I all know how much reliance has been placed on the courts, um, criminal and civil, on the post office's assurance, such as, quote, there is no remote access to the system or to individual branch terminals which would allow accounting records to be manipulated in any way. As you know, Alan, several of the spot reviews have presented what appears to be evidence that completely undermines and disproves statements like that. I'm pretty certain that in the event that even one of those spot reviews, for example, five, the Bracknell Basement Rodkin one, turns out to be irrefutable, then James will completely understand the implications, as I'm sure will Pohl's senior management. Was that issue mentioned by you on the call to Paul of Well, it's hard to be sure of what was said, um, what, 10 years ago in a call, but it was a very important issue, and I would have thought it probably was, yes. Um, remote I access would have completely undermined the post office's position. And why so? Because if Fujitsu or the post office can manipulate a sub-postmaster's accounts without the sub-postmaster knowing about it, then how can you prosecute that sub-postmaster for something which could not be provably down to the sub-postmaster? It might have been an, ac an action by the post office or by Fujitsu. Uh, it would... I think, completely undermine the question of the uh, standard of proof required in a criminal trial. So for you, was it an important or an unimportant matter? It was central to the entire business. And so this isn't a record of the call. It's not a minute made of the call. It's a briefing for the call. Yes. And in this part of it... 
it's not a narrative of what to say. It's a recitation of an email of about uh, 10 days before yes. between Second Sight and Mr. Bates, but referring to the Bracknell Basement uh, Rudkin spot review. Your um, evidence, as I understand it, is you believe that this um, issue of remote access was mentioned, uh, was um, addressed in the call with Paula Venels. I think it. I think it would have been yes. Can you um, not go any further than that in saying the detail that, in fact, you mentioned? I can't go any further than that because. It may well be that at this stage, the Bracknell Basement Rudkin issue was something which Second Sight was still trying to get final proof about. I can't remember whether at this stage, the post office was still denying that that meeting had ever taken place and that Second Sight were trying to get email evidence. I can't remember exactly when that uh, was resolved. Can we turn um, to a, a new document, please? Um, poll 3098379, which is the post office's minute of the call. When you say new, uh, Mr. Beard, do you mean very recently disclosed? Um, I mean new to Lord Arbuthnot. Right, fine. Just so that I'm clear. Thank you. I don't think you had this when you made your witness statement. No, I didn't. But I did. I was shown it this morning before I came in, and it, I think it may show that, if, if we go down a bit, it may show that the Rudkin issue was raised. Yes, so this is, um, just to be clear, we've looked at your briefing notes for the purposes of the call. Um, we've seen the Rudkin issue, I'll call it in summary, um, mentioned in it, and uh, we've heard what your recollection um, it is. Uh, can we look, please, at page two of the post office's note of the call? and look um, four bullet points in. I think that's a separate issue. Yes, but if you look at six bullet points in, you get to what you want, I think. Yes, you're quite right. Yes, I meant to ask about four bullets point in because it's the run-up to the conversation in bullet point six. We can just start at four. Um, JFSA raised the concern with um, James that the post office is continuing with prosecutions despite the review taking place, predicated on the, review, on the view that there is, quote, nothing wrong with Horizon. Uh, you did not think that we should be prosecuting on that basis, i.e. the post office should be prosecuting on that basis. And then Ms. Venels says, I think, I think because Second Sight have made noises about finding something. And she is recorded as promising to you to get back on that point. Um, on that point, was it your view that the at work of Second Sight affected, with the, affected the propriety of continuing to prosecute? Yes. And why was that? Because of the standard of proof required in a criminal prosecution. You need to be sure that the criminal activity has been done by a sub-postmaster accused as opposed to having been done by somebody else. And then the sixth bullet point, which is linked to the fourth, you're recorded as saying we should not go ahead, i.e., I think um, the post office should not go ahead 
uh, with prosecutions, presumably, until the post office can prove that there is no remote access to the system or branch terminal which can change the sub-postmaster's account. He did not say so, but I think Second Sight have suggested this. Does that help you to recollect with how the conversation went? Well, if, I, I certainly wouldn't question uh, that I raised that if this is what their minute says. No, I, I must have, uh, I must have uh, raised it as they say I did. Uh, I think I would not have told Paula Venels that Second Sight had suggested it, but it was something that I think Andrew Bridgen had been raising consistently because his constituent was Michael Rudkin. But this, in any event, um, is a record of, um, um, I think, Ms. Venels noting that um, Second Sight had suggested uh, that uh, the could be remote access to the system or a branch terminal which could change the sub-postmaster's account. She was saying that they might have done. Yeah. Yes. We've seen that can come down, thank you, that one of the points that the post office was taking at this stage in the narrative was that Second Sight should not be saying anything to anyone unless and until the post office had had the opportunity to respond to the points that the that Second Sight was putting to the post office. Yes. And I just want to um, look at what Second Sight was saying to you about that. Um, JARB 5053. And this is an email the next month uh, on the 12th of June from Ron Warmington of Second Sight. And he says, I'll send a proper response to your latest email um, later today. Um, I, I don't think we we'll need your help in getting the post office to respond to the spot reviews. They are responding, but you're not yet in a form that will really work in our um, interim report or in the 8th of July meeting. They are still, understandably, I suppose, incredibly defensive and nobody at the levels producing the responses is ready to give an inch. They probably fear it will be career death to concede any failings whatsoever. We have consistently and clearly asked for short, easy to understand, honest and complete answers to the assertions that we have put forward. What we are getting are highly technical, multi-page responses that will appear to many to have been crafted so as to avoid actually giving any answers to those assertions and allegations at all. Uh, without wishing to burden you with the detail, the attached is a pretty good example and shows my exasperation uh, uh, in trying to get them to, in capital letters, answer the blasted questions. Was this um, email that you received here and what Second Sight um, were then saying about the post office's um, approach at this time a recurrent theme? I think it was, um, particularly the use of the word defensive. Uh, thank you, that can come down. You've addressed in your witness statement, it's paragraphs 100 to 105, alongside um, numerous uh, contemporaneous documents exhibited to that part of the statement. The issues arising from the publication of the Second Sight Interim Report on the 8th of July 2013. And say for one point, I'm, I'm not going to explore that. And the exception is the role of Second Sight in relation to criminal cases. Um, can we just turn up um, paragraph 142 of your witness statement, please? Uh, 
which is on page 75. And we're jumping forwards um, significantly here. We're into January 2014, but it, it's the background to the questions um, uh, that I'm um, going to ask you. Um, th this is a, a conversation that happened with Paula Venables on the 28th of January 2014. And you say, um, she then said that Second Sight would not be advising the post office on criminal cases or prosecution policy as they were forensic accountants and not lawyers. I believe at the time this struck me as wrong. It was at odds with what she just said about not restricting Second Sight's ability to investigate the issues with Horizon. Accountants in their training and work have a great deal to do with criminal cases and prosecution. And then the, um, there's some other um, material. In relation to the first part of the Second Sight um, uh, work, what was your um, understanding and expectation of the extent to which Second Sight could investigate cases that had resulted in um, criminal proceedings or a criminal conviction? My understanding was that they could have the complete openness and transparency that uh, Paula Vennels had promised me uh, and access to any documents that they considered to be relevant, including documents that were confidential, uh, in order to get to the bottom of the issues that the post office told us they wanted to get to the bottom of. And that they, in that sentence early on, any documents that they considered relevant means any documents that Second Sight... Second Sight... Is that right? Con con second Sight considered relevant. Uh, can we look... Um, can we go back um, in the chronology then to uh, July 2013 and look at the notes of a meeting that you held in Parliament on the 8th of July... 2013, after the publication of Second Sight's interim report. It's poll 302-9664. Um, I think this is a, um, a meeting after the publication that day of the interim report between Second Sight, Alan Bates, um, Kaylin L. Shoesmith and a number of MPs. Um, can we look, please, um, at the bottom of page three? Can we scroll down? Thank you. Right at the bottom. And Andrew um, Brigden, MP, um, asked Second Sight if they believed the issues they'd identified had an impact in relation to the historic convictions. And then over the page, please. Um, Second Sight said that was a legal question which they were not qualified to answer, and they did not consider it was appropriate to uh, express an opinion. They have to present facts, and it's for others to consider the impact on his, any historic cases. Uh, firstly, would you agree with Second Sight's characterization of the limitations of their professional expertise? I'm not sure I would, really. Um, the, the key issue with the appointment of Second Sight was that they were going to have to look at a number of different issues. Computer programming, accountancy, the legal implications arising out of those things. And the key issue was that they should be independent of the post office. And so uh, I had rather greater faith in Second Sight's legal expertise uh, than it seems they did. Um, and particularly since they had discovered a potential prosecution of Joe Hamilton on the basis of theft when there was no evidence. They had raised that. And 
that was a, an ethical issue which seemed to have passed by the post office lawyers who ought to have picked it up. So Second Sight's limitations in their own minds, on their own ability, was not something that I would have accepted. As a, a separate issue, um, accepting the limitations that they themselves um, accepted, would that, um, in your view, have amounted to a proper bar in investigating the facts of any cases that had ended up as prosecutions or convictions? No. I, do, I don't think... I mean, what we had been promised was total transparency and total openness. Second sight were the independent investigators going into the post office to achieve that total transparency and openness. They were the people to look into these things, and so I wasn't prepared to accept any bar on what they were looking at. Um, can I just um, take you to their engagement letter with the post office, please? Um, poll five zeros two one three. Um, th this is um, uh, moving on to the, the second part of the enterprise, the ICRMS, um, uh, but may tell us something about the earlier part of the enterprise um, too. Uh, can we look at page six, please? And clause um, 5.1, if you scroll down. Um, in providing the services, second sight shall over the page, please. Um, act with the skill and care expected of qualified and experienced accountants. It's acknowledged that matters relating to criminal law and procedure are outside second sight scope of expertise and accordingly shall not be required to give an opinion in relation to such matters. Would you agree that um, in the light of this letter of appointment, um, they should not offer expert opinion on matters of criminal law or procedure? Well, this letter of appointment is dated the 1st of July 2014. Yes. And that was close to the period at which this entire process broke down. Um, I actually believe that accountants are pretty well able to deal with legal issues in the same way as lawyers are pretty well able to deal with accountancy issues. I suspect that this letter of appointment, I don't know whether Second Sight signed it or not, I don't know, I can't remember when I first saw it, it may have been in relation to giving evidence in this. It is. Oh, I right, think. okay. Um, uh, I don't know whether uh, Second Sight signed it. I think they did. They did. Um, I mean, you, you're right, um, Lord Arbuthnot, that um, perhaps oddly, at the beginning of the uh, mediation process, there was no letter of appointment, um, and the post office um, raised the issue of a letter of appointment towards the end of the process, and this was it. Oh, well. I bet this was... Yes, OK. Right. In any event, as to my earlier question, even accepting this, would you um, agree that any um, accepted limitation by second sight on their ability to offer an opinion on issues relating to criminal law and procedure um, should be a bar to them investigating cases that ended up in criminal proceedings or a conviction? Certainly not. I mean, that, that would be an illogical sequence of uh, events. Thank you. That can come down. Uh, the um, post office prepared a, um, a briefing for responding to the second site interim report of the 8th of July, um, 2013. Uh, can we look at that, please? Um, FUJ 308. 
And uh, can we look, please, on page nine at the bottom? Under spot review five. Remember, that was mentioned earlier, the Rodkin basement issue. Um, this spot review principally focuses on an assertion by Michael Rodkin that during a visit to Fujitsu's site at Bracknell on Tuesday, the 19th of August 2008, he observed an individual uh, based in the basement of the building who demonstrated the ability to access live branch data and directly adjust transactions on the system. Given the amount of time that's passed, neither Fujitsu nor, uh, sorry, neither the post office nor Fujitsu have any record of Mr. Rodkin attending the Bracknell site. Post office and Fujitsu have attempted to establish the uh, Bracknell visitor logs for the day in question to verify Mr. Rodkin's attendance and his contact on the day. However, these records are not retained for as far back as 2008. Fujitsu have additionally made the effort to go through all email documents and archived information to hand, but do not have any information for Tuesday the 19th of August 2008 would, that would suggest that they had visitors to the site. Further review into the post office work logs indicated that there were just three pol uh, post office test managers present um, on site in Bracknell on the 19th of August 2008. None of them have any calendar records relating to a visit by Mr. Rudkin. It has, however, been determined that in August 2008, the basement of Fujitsu's building contained a Horizon test environment that would look very similar to a live Horizon environment. This environment was not physically or technologically connected to the live Horizon environment. It was therefore impossible for anyone in this room to have adjusted any live transaction records, though Mr. Rodkin may have witnessed some form of adjustment to the test environment. This separation of test and live environments is designed to guarantee the integrity of um, Horizon um, data. That can come down, thank you. Arising from um, uh, the second site interim report and uh, the post office's response to it, uh, did you um, understand it then, that's July 2003, uh, that, uh, 2013, that the post office was denying that remote access to um, Horizon accounts was possible? Yes. Uh, prior to the publication of the interim report, uh, did um, Second Sight tell you uh, anything about um, remote access to Horizon accounts? I can't remember exactly when I heard about this very odd business of Michael Rudkin visiting Fujitsu. Um, but I do believe that Second Sight, whether it was Ron Warmington or Ian Henderson, told me that they were trying to get to the bottom of it, that they were trying to find evidence, and that without that evidence of emails or calendar entries or whatever, they would find it difficult to be absolutely definitive in their interim report about there being remote access to Horizon. Did um, Second Sight ever tell you of a conversation that they said they had with Simon Baker of Post Office's IT department on the 22nd of May 2013, where, um, so say Second Sight, Simon Baker had said that Fujitsu had come clean about its ability remotely to access live data and to make changes to it. It seems unlikely that they would have told me about that because uh, I'd have gone stomping all over the place if they had, I think. But I can't be absolutely sure. And I think it follows that um, they, Second Sight, uh, didn't tell you that um, uh, Mr. Baker um, had, so said Second Sight, informed Alwyn Lyons and Susan Crichton of this. I don't think they did or of a conversation on the 22nd of May, of which a recording um, exists, 2013, where this issue was further discussed? I don't think they did. 
aside from those conversations between Second Sight and Post Office uh, personnel, the inquiry has heard a lot of other evidence in relation to the remote access capabilities of Fujitsu, including um, evidence from John Simpkins, from Ann Chambers, um, from um, written policy documents setting out the extent to which there existed unrestricted and unaudited privileged access uh, in some parts of Fujitsu um, to um, Horizon data. But what would your view have been um, had this material been disclosed to you in mid-2013? It would have been that there had been a large, a large number of miscarriages of justice, that the convictions that had uh, been secured by the post office were unsafe, and that most, if not all, of the post office's convictions of sub-postmasters should be re-examined in, uh, in the forum probably of the uh, Criminal Cases Review Commission. Uh, you make the point in your witness statement that this, 8th of July 2013, was um, the very time at which the post office was probably commissioning advice from Simon Clark, an employed barrister at Cartwright King, yes. about the effect of the Second Sight report and indeed some other documents and information that um, he was passed uh, on the evidence that Gareth Jenkins had given in a string of cases that have resulted in the conviction and in some cases imprisonment of sub-postmasters. Yes. Did you know uh, that shortly after the publication of the Second Sight interim report that the post office was informed um, that that witness, Mr. Jenkins, which it had used to provide evidence in a series of prosecutions, uh, had failed to disclose to the court material which undermined the opinions that he gave. No. Uh, that the post office was advised that he hadn't complied with his duties to the court. No. Uh, that the post office was advised that his credibility as an expert witness was fatally undermined. No. And that the post office was advised that it itself had been bre in breach of its duties as a prosecutor and that there were therefore a number of convicted sub-postmasters to whom disclosure should have been given but was not given? No. <clears throat> in all of the conversations that you had with um, the post office at this time, was there any mention of any of those facts and matters? No. Was there any hint uh, that um, the post office was... Um, in receipt of any um, advice or direction which um, ought to cause them to examine uh, the safety of previous convictions, uh, their duties of disclosure, or the reference of any cases to the CCRC? Quite the reverse. Uh, what was the reverse that was being said? We were being told that the Horizon system continued to be robust, that the convictions were safe, and that there was no remote access. Was anything ever hinted at about the matters that I've mentioned in all of the meetings, conversations, letters, and email exchanges that you had with everyone at the post office from Alice Perkins and Paula Venels downwards? Not once. Were there convicted sub-postmasters within um, the JFSA? There were, yes. But were there... Um, convicted sub-postmasters whom uh, you were um, uh, pressing the case for? Yes. Joe Hamilton was one of them. When was the first time that you learned that the post office had been um, informed of the um, facts and matters that I've mentioned? I think it was the 18th of November 2020 when the Clark advice came up in the Court of Appeals hearing to overturn convictions of 39 sub-postmasters. So seven and a bit years later? Yes.
can we turn to the mediation scheme, which is the second part of yes. the second site story? And first dealing with the setting up of it. You tell us in paragraph 114 of your witness statement about a meeting concerning the setting up of what became the mediation scheme and uh, refer us to a minute from the post office of that meeting. Can we turn to that, please? Uh, poll 309-9354. So I've rather blithely um, skipped over what we've just discussed, which was that the post office internally was being advised about breaches of duty, failures of candor, breaches of its own duty as a prosecutor having an impact or possible impact on the safety of convictions and none of that was revealed to you. I did raise this with the Minister, Lord Callanan, on the 20th of November 2020. I was not blithe. No. Then um, the worm had turned by November 2020? Yes. Would you expect to have been told something back in July 2013? Not necessarily of the detail of the legal advice that the post office was being given, but about the consequences of it? Yes, but it's not just that I would expect to have been told something it would have been essential for the sub-postmasters who had been convicted to be told something because their convictions were potentially unsafe. We're going to come in a moment to the setting up of the um, uh, mediation scheme and the operation of the mediation scheme. In general terms, what did the post office do in relation to that group of people who were um, uh, stood convicted of a criminal offence in the mediation scheme? In general terms, they started by saying, yes, everybody can join the mediation scheme and we'll try and get to the bottom of their cases, uh, which sounded to me to be very good. Um, you can apply to the mediation scheme. We may need to involve the CCRC or the, the Criminal Cases Review Commission, uh, but certainly you can apply. That was what they began by saying. But then later on, what they said was, if you've pleaded guilty or if you've been convicted, then uh, you must go to the back of the queue. But in the final meeting at which the bust-up between the MPs and the post office took place on the 27th of November 2014, they said, well, we don't see why someone like Joe Hamilton should even be included in the mediation scheme. She pleaded guilty, so she's stuffed. And if we just take this document down whilst we discuss that, uh, please... What was your understanding throughout the mediation scheme until that point as to whether um, uh, Joe Hamilton was somebody who um, should be able to benefit from it? Well, it was, it was perfectly obvious to me that the post office and I were agreeing that Joe Hamilton could be included in the mediation scheme. Um, what would you have done if at, at the beginning, uh, which we're about to turn to, they'd said, no, 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 People like Joe Hamilton can't be included. Well, I wouldn't have agreed to it. And why not? 
because I believed from the beginning that Jo Hamilton uh, had not committed the offences for which she pleaded guilty. And so clearly there needed to be a proper investigation, preferably with the help of Second Sight, but in any event with an independent element into what had gone wrong in her case. And there were lots of other MPs who were very active and who had constituents in the same position. We wouldn't have agreed to a mediation scheme which excluded those who'd pleaded guilty or been found, been found guilty in court. Can we turn um, uh, to the setting up then of the scheme and the document we were just looking at, poll 3099354. And if we can just scan through, this is the, essentially the meeting which um, led to the setting up of the mediation scheme. You'll see that the people present are uh, Paula Venels, you, Ron Warmington, Ian Henderson, um, Susan Crichton, Mark Davis, um, and Alwyn Lyons. And we'll see that Ms. Venels welcomed everyone to the meetings, saying that they wanted to work collaborative, collaboratively, respond to learnings, um, and put um, a process in place to move the cases forward. And then if you just scroll through that to yourself, and if we scroll down, please. And then over the, case, over the page, please. There's quite a lot of um, practical and technical detail there. And then carry on, please. Scrolling. Was Can you stop there? Yes. At the top of the page, you see it was thought that Gareth Jenkins produced high quality and he may be able to help the process. An interesting point. Oh, well, sorry, carry on. Yes, so this is, um, I think you're pointing out that this is eight days after the post office had received an advice saying that he was discredited as a witness, couldn't no. be used no. ever in a future prosecution and a breach of duties to the court. Out, yes. That's yeah. what I'm pointing out. In this um, uh, minute, is there any suggestion that any class of people would be excluded from the scheme as a whole? No. Um, or that they would have restricted rights within it? No. For example, that their case could not pro uh, progress to mediation. And is that reflective of the fact that there was no such limitation? There was no such limitation. And at this stage, does it follow that you didn't understand that the post office saw any restriction in them entering or progressing through the scheme? Absolutely. Can we look please at poll 00146048? A letter to Mr. Bates of the 27th of August, um, 2013, from Angela Vanden Bogart. We can see at the foot of the page And then um, if we scroll up, uh, this is a letter to Mr. Bates of the JFSA about the setting up of the scheme. Um, third paragraph, sorry, fourth paragraph in collaboration with JFSA and a group of MPs um, led by you, post office established an inquiry into Horizon. Second site was appointed to lead the inquiry. Interim report is copied in or a link is given to it. Post Office now wishes to offer a scheme to sub-postmasters so that individual sub-postmasters um, have an opportunity to raise their concerns directly with the Post Office in partnership with sub-postmasters at JFSA and Second Sight and interested MPs. All sides can then work towards resolving these concerns. Uh, enclosed is a pack of documents describing how the scheme will work. 
I'm not going to go through all of those. Postmaster not obliged to submit her case to the scheme, their legal rights will remain. And then a deadline of the 18th of November 2013. Any suggestion in that of exclusion of a whole class of people? No. Or that they would have restrictive rights? No. But we can look through the pack that was sent, but I don't think there's any suggestion um, in that pack that was sent alongside this letter of any such inclusion. Was any information fed to you from any other source at this time that a whole class of people would be cut out from the uh, benefits of the scheme? No. You tell us in your witness statement, no need to turn it up, um, it's paragraph 120, that uh, on the announcement of the um, uh, mediation scheme, you did an interview outside Joe Hamilton's shop yes. in South Warmborough. Yes. And the thought that the post office might exclude Joe Hamilton from the scheme um, didn't cross your mind for a moment at that time? No, it didn't. You tell us in your statement that around this time you thought that the people you were dealing with in the post office were dealing with the matter in good faith? Yes. And intended to work towards a resolution of all of the, all of the outstanding cases? Yes, that's what I thought. Knowing what you know now, does that remain your view? No. And why not? What I know now is that they had commissioned the clerk advice. I'm so sorry, the, the um, document can come down from the screen. Right. They had commissioned the clerk advice. They knew that the evidence that had given rise to a number of prosecutions uh, had led to those prosecutions being unsafe. They knew that there were a large number of bugs in the system which they had not told MPs about. They were operating... I've never got to the bottom of Project Sparrow, but they were operating some sort of behind-the-scenes uh, deception process, which suggests to me now that they were stringing MPs along in order to preserve the robust robustness of Horizon the existence of Horizon and possibly the existence of the post office. That's what I know now, but I didn't know that at the time. If we can turn up page 66 of your witness statement, please. You say that I understand that during September 2013, Susan Crichton left the post office. I do not, not know why she left, but it may be important, because it was, I now see, looking back on it, ar around this time that the post office's approach changed. Their change of attitude may have been because they had been expecting Second Sight, whom Susan Crichton had recommended, to give Horizon a clean bill of health, which Second Sight had not done. The post office clearly did not like that. 125. Alternatively or additionally, it may have been partly because Susan Crichton's replacement, Chris Oyard, brought a different tone to the post office's dealings. I cannot exactly put my finger on it. I felt uncomfortable with him and thought him uncommitted to the process we were going through. I cannot at this remove of time uh, give details of what he said or did or in which meetings to give rise to that feeling. But I do remember thinking that things were somehow different, less open, more combative because of him. That can come down, thank you. You tell us in um, these paragraphs that the post office did not like it, that Second Sight had give, uh, not given them a clean bill of health. How did they make that known to you? Well, they portrayed 
Second Sight's interim report as giving Horizon a clean bill of health when clearly it hadn't. And that led me to think that they didn't like what Second Sight had said about Horizon. But it's really looking back on it that I think that they so objected to what Second Sight had said. And they obviously later objected to it a great deal more in view of what Second Sight said later. You tell us that um, Mr. Oyard brought a different tone to the post office's dealings, that you can't put a finger on it, but things were less open and more combative um, because of him. Was that immediately after he took over as general counsel? No, I think it was a gradual impression that arose uh, because the mediation scheme gave rise to what I or somebody else described as a legal battlefield with him as the sort of general commanding of that, uh, that process. Uh, so I think it was gradual rather than immediate because I take people as I find them um, and I was prepared to give him the benefit of the doubt to start with. Of course at this time um, September 2013 that's um, only two months or so after the provision of the Simon Clark advice. Yes. You um, didn't know at the time that the post office had been told that some of its prosecution evidence was tainted. No, I didn't. And therefore some of its um, prosecutions um, may have been unsafe or at least information needed to be disclosed to sub-postmasters for them to um, question that issue. Yes, I didn't know that. Are you able to point to any particular conversation or communication that led to the impression that the post office was becoming less open or more combative? Um, I can go through my witness statement to find some, but uh, it was a gradual impression rather than a uh, rather than this was the point, although. September 2013 seemed to be roughly the break point between when the post office was trying to get to the bottom of any issues with Horizon and believing that there weren't any, and the later period when they were trying to fail to answer Second Sight's questions or fail to disclose documents to Second Sight or failed to allow MPs any information about what was going on with their constituents. So this was roughly the break, break point. At the time, did you draw any um, link between the extent to which that may, that though that conduct may be, be because of knowledge that uh, convictions may be unsafe? No. Uh, in any event, the mediation scheme gets set up and gets um, up and running. Yes. Sir Anthony Hooper is appointed as chairman of the mediation scheme, and you deal with the process by which he came to be identified and his appointment in detail in your witness statement, again exhibiting many documents, um, contemporaneous documents, backing up what you say. Can I just pick out a couple of moments in the narrative, please? Yep. Um, firstly, you tell us about a meeting you held in your office with the post office on the 28th of January uh, 2014, and there's a post office minute of that meeting. It's poll 3026743. Um, can we see who um, is present? 
Um, you, Alice Perkins, um, Paula Venels, Janet Walker, your Chief of Staff, and David Oliver. Just um, to refresh your memory, David Oliver was the program manager for Project Sparrow. Did you know um, anything about Project Sparrow at the time? No, I didn't. I still don't know much, if anything, about it because uh, I haven't been into it, really. I just want to ask you about a specific point that's recorded in um, at these notes of this meeting on the 28th of January 2014. It's on page three, please. Um, third paragraph, beginning at AP. Um, AP said that the post office should have had a letter of engagement in place with Second Sight from the start and that this, uh, I should say the previous discussion was about getting a letter of engagement out, was now putting that issue right. Um, you agreed that there should have been a letter in place. But Paula Venel suggested that if Second Sight's nervousness was that the post office was trying to restrict them from raising issues, she could assure you that the engagement letter was not designed to restrict in any way Second Sight's ability to investigate issues with Horizon that were raised by applicants to the scheme. And then there's uh, some more text about the drafting of the letter. Did that um, uh, kind of communication in the course of the meeting that there would be um, no restriction in any way on Second Sight's ability to investigate issues with Horizon that were raised by applicants of the scheme um, contribute to your belief that there was no restriction or no restriction was to be introduced on Second Sight's ability to investigate all and any issues with Horizon? Um, it did, except that she then went on to contradict herself. Uh, but yes, because from the start, Second Sight had been promised access to any documents that they, Second Sight, believed they needed. And we, the MPs, had been promised complete openness and transparency. Um, this is a point that you make in your witness statement on um, page 74, if we can turn that up, please. At the, sorry, just catching up. Page 74 at the foot of the page, please. At the last three lines, it seems from the note, that's the note I've just taken to you, taken you to. It seems from the note that Paula Venels told me that Second Sight's engagement letter was not designed to restrict in any way Second Sight's ability to investigate issues with Horizon, then over the page. This was not the first time she had promised access for Second Sight to any document or file that was relevant to the, their investigation. But did you have, as a result of things that Paula Venels had said to you, an expectation that there would be full openness and transparency? Yes. From the start of the mediation, did you believe that Second Sight would be given access to investigation files? Yes. Including if those investigation files were the very files which contained um, data, the um, analysis of data, and post offices' views on such uh, data that were relevant to the issues to be mediated? Yes. Was it right that at that point, full access and liberty to examine and investigate all issues were very important to you? Yes. Uh, can we look just before lunch, please, at poll 0010, 
O triple two. And this is an email um, from your chief of staff. Um, on the minute we've just looked at, i.e. asking for um, matters to be included or recorded within them. And having checked over the minute, um, Ms. Walker responds on your behalf by saying, with regard to the minutes, James thinks they're absolutely fine except for a few differences which he would like recorded. And then point two, Paula Venels confirmed that if problems were found with Horizon, that Second Sight were at liberty to investigate. In other words, there were no no-go areas in the investigations. Uh, firstly, um, was that said at the meeting? Um, I believe it probably was. Um, and... If I were saying that the minutes should be amended to include that, I think it almost certainly was. And secondly, was it a matter of importance to you it was, to, es to establish that there were no no-go areas? It was certainly a matter of importance, yes. And why so? Because if there had been any no-go areas, then the post office would be able to hide potential issues of miscarriages of justice. Thank you very much, Lord Arbuthnot. Sir, it's one o'clock. Uh, Indeed it is. Uh, what time do you want to restart, Mr. Beer? Can we say 10 to 2, please, sir? Yeah, by all means. That, that's acceptable to everyone in the hearing room, I take it, including the person who has the arduous job of transcribing. Yes, she's just um, nodded very slightly. <laughs> yes, I'm very sorry, but I take it we're under a little pressure of time today, Mr. Beer. We are, so I plan to um, um, ask Lord Arbuthnot questions till approximately 2.30, uh, yeah. and then to link in um, uh, with Sir Anthony Hooper, who Mr. Blake is um, questioning. Fine. All right. See you at 10 to 2. Thank you very much, sir.
Uh, good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear us? <coughs> yes, I can. Um, Mr. Beer, before we start, uh, for no more than uh, probably some seconds, Sir Anthony Hooper was visible to me. Um, I don't know whether he's visible in the hearing room anymore, but regardless of that, if he wants to listen to what's going on, there's no problem about that, clearly. Um, I just wanted to check wh whether you could see him. No, we can't, sir, and, and sorry right. to give you a fright. <laughs> no, 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 no problem. Thank you. Uh, Lord Arbuthnot, good afternoon. Hello. Uh, you deal in paragraph 143 onwards, which is on page 75 of your uh, witness statement, right up until page 89, paragraph 184, of the events of February to early August 2014, in terms of the mediation scheme. Um, again, what you say um, is all cross-referenced to the contemporaneous material that you've exhibited, and I'm not going to ask you in detail about that period. Overall, is it fair to say that the breakdown in the relationship um, between uh, the JFSA and MPs on the one hand and post office on the other, and the post office on the one hand and second sight on the other, began to emerge at that stage? Yes, it is. Can I turn to the time when uh, Second Sight produced part two of its initial complaint review and mediation scheme briefing report? And that <coughs> is the 21st of August 2014. <coughs> and if it helps, um, if, can we turn up, please, paragraph 166 of your witness statement on page 90 on the screen, please? Yes. Page 90. And paragraph 166, about the report of um, the 21st of August uh, 2014, you say, um, the report contains many points that were damning. Uh, whether at the time um, I saw it, I recognised quite how damning they were is less clear in my mind. There's no reference, for example, to the post office or Fujitsu being able to access Horizon remotely, something I remember being concerned about. But the question, quote, is Horizon fit for purpose, is answered by Second Sight's conclusion, no. Uppermost in my own mind was always the question, have the actions taken against these sub-postmasters, whether disciplinary, litigious, or prosecutory, been fair, and are the results safe? The conclusion I would have drawn from the summary whenever I did see it was almost certainly not, and certainly not in every case. Can we look, please, at the uh, report itself? Poll 3030160. This is the report that you're talking about, the part two second sight report. And I'm not going to go through it all. It's over 20 pages in length, and it speaks for itself. Can I just look at one part, please? Um, page 22. Um, reading from the bottom, paragraph 22.1. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Um, the report deals with things um, under headings or themes, and there are headings of training, of um, contract issues, uh, and this is dealing here uh, with post office investigations. And second sites say, and to be clear, this is a report that goes to the post office, including to Paula Venels and the then chair of the post office, Alice Perkins. Um, as a result of our um, investigations, we've established that Post Office's investigation team has in many cases failed to identify the underlying root cause of shortfalls prior to initiating civil recovery or criminal proceedings. Uh, this includes cases where applicants 
brought to the auditor's or investigator's attention their own suspicions as to the underlying root causes. Is that one of the paragraphs uh, that you had in mind when you said that you would have drawn the conclusion, um, have the actions been taken against sub-postmasters, including uh, litigious or prosecutorial, safe? Yes, certainly it is. Uh, many applicants, it continues, and almost all the professional advisers assert there was inadequate investigation prior to suspension without pay, termination, or civil criminal action. Based on the cases examined so far, post office's investigators seem to have defaulted to seeking evidence that would support a charge of false accounting rather than carrying out an investigation into the root cause of any suspected problems. Evidence to support a charge of false accounting is often easily obtained, since when confronted during interview with evidence of obviously overstated cash figures, the accused person will often readily admit to falsifying the end of trading period accounts and over the page. With the exception of an interview conducted in accordance with PACE, we note that the interviewee is not allowed to be legally represented, although they may be accompanied by a friend, albeit with very limited powers. Interviews will usually be recorded, and when an admission has been made, this will virtually always trigger a guilty plea by the defendant and often an associated repayment proposal. As a result, post office investigators seem to have found that recording admissions of false accounting was the key to achieving relatively rapid and, to the post office, inexpensive asset recovery. As a consequence of this, post office's investigators seem to have de-emphasized the importance of unearthing the true root cause of the mysterious shortfalls that applicants claim to have suffered. Even when faced with requests from sub-postmasters for investigative help, this has often been refused. Regrettably, this refusal to provide investigative support is in line with the standard contract. It's clear from comments made by applicants this is clearly contrary to their expectations and that they were unaware that under um, a part of the contract, the Post Office Investigation uh, Division does not have a mandate to provide general investigative support to sub-postmasters. Post Office's instructions to and training of its investigators seems to have disregarded the possibility that the Horizon system could in any way, that could be in any way relevant to their investigations. A consequence of this flawed approach to investigations is that in many opportunities, is that many opportunities for process improvements have been missed. And then last page. I think that is the last page. Thank you very much. Uh, is that the um, uh, included in your description of the report containing uh, many conclusions that were damning? Yes, it was an asset recovery process rather than a, uh, an application for justice. You tell us in your witness statement that by this time you'd come to trust Ron Warmington and Ian Henderson. Yes. Your feeling about their approach was that they were straightforward, open, competent and experienced in the, individual, in the issues with which you were all dealing. Yes. You had by this stage abandoned um, your initial suspicion of at least Ron Warmington's past friendship with Susan Crichton. Precisely. And you say in your witness statement, at the same time, the post office personnel with whom I was dealing had become defensive, legalistic, and determined to keep from MPs information about which they had previously promised to be open. Where there was a dispute between Second Sight and the post office, I felt more inclined to favor Second Sight's version. Yes. Sorry, that can come down, thank you. Where you say that um, the post office personnel with whom you were dealing had become defensive, legalistic, and determined to keep from MPs information. Uh, who are you referring to there? Well, particularly Paula Van Ols. Uh, I can't remember precisely which meetings I had with Chris Ojard and Angela Van Den Boga, but um, those were the people with whom I dealt with most. Uh, Alice Perkins to a certain extent as well. Uh, can we... Um, go to page 92 of your witness statement, please. Paragraph 170.
page 92, paragraph 170. And you, um, I'm not going to go to the letter because you summarise it here, uh, that on the 5th of September 2014, Angela Vanden Bogard wrote to Second Sight, asking Second Sight to reconsider their recommendation that a particular case was suitable for mediation. The reason she gave boiled down to the fact the applicant had pleaded guilty in court to false accounting and theft, so there was no basis left for mediation. And then skipping on in the same paragraph, you say, if the same logic were applied to all of the cases where there had been guilty pleas, then the basis of the mediation scheme would have been fundamentally changed. Was this one of the aspects um, which uh, led ultimately to the breakdown of the mediation scheme? Yes. Uh, paragraph 171. You tell us it had always been obvious that the mediation scheme wouldn't have been able to alter convictions in court. Uh, in the question um, you'd asked in Parliament, if we go over the page, you said we must look after them and try and provide them with redress, perhaps through the CCRC. Yes. Is it right, therefore, that you saw the mediation scheme not um, as a means of overturning or even questioning um, uh, by the words used by Second Sight uh, convictions themselves, but providing an investigatory platform and uncovering material that might itself lead to a reference to the CCRC? Quite. It would give rise to further processes uh, overturning miscarriages of justice. Thank you. You deal in your witness statement, again supported by the contemporaneous material, with the post office's response to um, Second Sight's second report. Can I just pick out um, some key uh, passages, if I may? Um, paragraph 178 on page 95. The long and the short of it um, is summarised um, in paragraph 178. The post office replied to the second report and said it was unable to endorse it. Yes. What did you think when the post office said that it was unable to endorse the report? By this stage I wasn't surprised because of the post office's defensiveness, secrecy, <coughs> legalism um, and the fact that it seemed to be blocking information uh, to go to second sight and the uh, part two report was not kind to the post office. Uh, and the post office was going to get even more defensive when it came out. Uh, you tell us in the second part of paragraph 179, which is on the screen there, that when you saw the reply, you assumed from its tone that it, be, it had been drafted mainly by Chris Oyart, as it struck you as unconvincing, defensive, offhand, and designed to be obstructive. Yes. Uh, wh why did you associate um, this reply with Mr Oyart? because I considered him to be unconvincing, defensive, offhand, and obstructive. Um, this all culminated in a meeting in your office at Port Cullis House on the 17th of November 2014. Um, we can see that from um, paragraph 198 on page 103. Your, um, you referred earlier today into a meeting um, in which the, I think you said the MPs let rip or some similar um, expression. Um, was this the meeting you were referring to? It is. Uh, were there strongly expressed views by MPs at that meeting? Very strongly expressed views. Uh, to what effect? To the effect that the MPs essentially broke off relations with the post office and said that the post office's uh, behaviour had been such that we couldn't trust the post office anymore 
and that we weren't prepared to take further part in the mediation scheme or negotiations with the post office. We can see from 199, if we go over the page, please, um, your memory of the meeting. And you say you felt it was controlled on the post office side by Angela Vanden Bogard and Chris Oyard. They said the post office should exclude altogether from the mediation scheme people who pleaded guilty. A different proposition from an earlier one that had been made of being uh, put to the back of the queue. And you asked them how they thought you would have supported a scheme which excluded my constituent, Joe Hamilton, to which they had no answer. And for that, for you, that was the final straw. And you say Paul of Venel seemed almost cowed by their stronger personalities and said little. I told her she was breaking her word. I sensed, rightly or wrongly, that she felt ashamed and the meeting broke up in acrimony. Does that accurately reflect what happened? It does, yes. Uh, why um, did you think Angela Vanden Bogard and uh, Chris Oyard were um, seeking to resile on the promises, as you saw it, that had previously been given by Paula Venels about which issues could be investigated and access to which documents would be given? I thought at the time that they were worried that Second Sight was actually uncovering something really crucial about Horizon that they were worried that Second Sight was getting too close to the truth and that if they allowed Second Sight to go on uncovering these things, it posed an existential threat to the future of Horizon and that that in turn posed an existential threat to the future of the post office. That's what I think I thought they were doing and I still think that that's what they were doing. And so it was the conclusions that had been reached in this um, second, second site report that, in your view, were fundamental to a, um, a, a sea change or a, a step change in the post office's position? Yes, although they'd begun before the second part of the second site report came out. Um, in paragraph um, 201 of your statement, which is on um, at page 106, you say that um, shortly after that meeting, Paula Venels wrote to you um, rejecting a proposition that there should be a presumption in favour of second sight's um, recommendation as to who should go forward for mediation. Yes. I think what you've been suggesting is that um, if Second Sight uh, suggested that an individual case should go forward to mediation, then that case should presumptively go forward to mediation. Yes, well, MPs, when we'd gone in for the mediation scheme in the first place, uh, had expected that every case would go forward to mediation except for one or two outliers that might obviously have been a sub-postmaster trying it on. Did you see anything controversial in a proposition that if an independent investigator recommended that a case should go to mediation, then the case should go to mediation? Uh, nothing controversial, not least since the independent investigator had been appointed and recommended by the post office itself. Can we look at the Paula Venel's uh, letter to you, poll 0010 1699? And this is her letter to you of the 28th of November 2014. Um, she says, thank you, for your, uh, thank you for meeting in your office on the 17th of November. I'm setting out um, the post office's position on the proposition put forward that there should be a general presumption that the post office will agree, uh, save in a few undefined exceptional cases, to mediate all cases where this is the recommendation of second side regardless of their merits and specific circumstances. Having considered the proposition carefully and having discussed it as promised with my board, 
I've concluded I cannot agree to it. But you tell us in your witness statement that this gave you um, a sleepless night or, or sleepless nights. Is that right? Well, this is what um, it seems I told Alice Perkins, yes. Uh, but uh, I think the sleepless night came from the breakdown of the whole process. And so it wasn't specifically the rejection of this proposal. It was more that you could see that the writing was very clearly on the wall. Yes. Can we look at your um, reply then, please? Poll 0010700. Uh, this is your reply to Paul of Ennals of the 8th of December 2014. It's a long and detailed letter. Uh, I only want to look at the conclusions, if I may, on, um, para on page three. Yes, I'm sorry it's so long. And if we scroll down, please. Under conclusions from paragraph 13 onwards, you uh, begin a series of um, uh, paragraphs um, uh, in the same way, despite something. Um, uh, despite the fact that Second Sight have identified the issues of investigations and contract giving rise to concern, dot, 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 the post office response to the 22nd of September stated, amongst other things, that contracts and post office investigations were outside of Second Sight's remit. Despite your agreement that the mediation scheme was to be available to all sub-postmasters who, who, whose cases had been identified by Second Sight as giving rise to concern, in recent months, post office has been objecting to around 90% of the cases going forward to mediation. Despite, paragraph 15, your agreement to fund the engagement of professional advisors to support sub-postmasters, in all relevant stages of the process. The post office is attempting, in the absence of representation by those professional advisors, to have 90% of cases excluded from mediation over the page. Despite your agreement that those who have pleaded guilty would be able to take advantage of the mediation scheme, post office has objected to cases going to mediation on the ground that the sub-postmaster has pleaded guilty. You put forward these arguments in secret, and when MPs asked you in July how the mediation scheme was going, you pleaded in the interest of, quote, the integrity of the mediation scheme. Clearly, the Post Office is aware of the Limitation Act point set out above. It has enough lawyers. The Post Office could, collay, uh, could allay any suspicion that this was a factor in the way it has been behaving by agreeing that it will not take any um, time-barred limitation point in resisting legal claims. Will you agree to this? I think the answer came back, no. It did. From Paula Venels. Uh, uh, you make the point in paragraph 20, you won't be standing at the next general election. And so um, uh, some of the MPs um, have agreed that Kevin Jones would take over your role in the group. And you say at the end of paragraph uh, 20, I, in any event, I couldn't continue negotiating with you because I've lost faith in the post office board's commitment to a fair resolution of this issue and I shall be pursuing the need for justice in other ways. I think you made a press release um, on that day as well. I think I did. Uh, poll 0010-1690. And uh, under the heading MPs lose faith in post office mediation scheme, you're reported in the second paragraph um, as saying the scheme was set up to help our constituents seek redress and maintain the post office's good reputation. It's doing neither. It's ended up mired in legal wrangling with the post office objecting to most of the cases, even going into the mediation that the scheme was designed to provide. I can no longer give it my support. I shall now be pursuing justice for sub-postmasters in other ways. Yes. And to the, um, that uh, letter, the conclusions of the letter that you wrote, and that part of the press release that I've um, read to you, uh, mark the withdrawal on your side of the equation from MPs' engagement with the post office and its mediation scheme. Yes. Can I turn to the termination of the scheme by the post office and look at 
page 137 of your witness statement. Page 137. You say that on the 10th of March 2015, you heard via a post office press release that the post office had sacked Second Sight and disbanded Sir Anthony Hooper's independent working group. Uh, you thought there was a strong risk that the post office would try to suppress the uh, briefing report that we've just read. So you wrote a letter to Paula Venables making a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, is it right that um, they replied to the Freedom of Information Act request saying it was exempt from disclosure, but they were voluntarily going to give you a copy anyway? Yes. But why did you think that they, the post office would try to suppress the report? I thought they'd tried to suppress so much else that um, I couldn't trust them to release that. Thank you, that can come down. Now, although there was some desultory correspondence after this, um, I think the next major event, and for you personally, it was a significant one, was the dissolution of Parliament on the 30th of March, 2015, and your cessation on that day as an MP. Yes. After that time, is it fair to say that your role in um, the... Um, investigation of Horizon and the post office's conduct um, changed? Yes, it is. I was no longer an MP and I was just sort of getting involved where I could, but that wasn't in many areas because of the group litigation. Um, you um, were ennobled in October 2015. Yes. And I think maybe you're downplaying a little bit your um, uh, involvement after. Um, that time. You address in the balance of your witness statement a range of issues that you did have involvement in in the eight years since then. Yes. Um, they include, I'm just going to list them, um, uh, the swift review, um, paragraphs 277 to 279 of your witness statement. Uh, your involvement in and commentary on the group litigation paragraphs 280 to 308. Um, the emergence of the Clark advice and what you did when the Clark advice did emerge in November 2020, and you've told us immediately, uh, you told us earlier that immediately you wrote to Lord Callanan, you wrote to the Speaker, and you wrote to the Lord Speaker. And you um, uh, give commentary on um, the governance of Post Office Limited, uh, governance um, by the government in terms of its management and oversight of the company that it owns, and the approach that ought to be taken by government to a body which um, uh, is said to enjoy an arm's length um, relationship with the government. Yes. And you address finally your position on the board um, uh, of the Horizon Compensation Compensation Advisory Board yes. and its efforts to secure redress. Yes. I've galloped through those last um, topics, which cover a period of nearly eight years, um, at, at some pace. Uh, Lord Arbuthnot, is there anything else that you wish to say at this point uh, concerning uh, what has been described as a national scandal? I think that with the help of this inquiry, we are moving belatedly to the right place. And so I'd like to say thank you. So from my perspective, they're the only questions um, that I have for um, Lord Arbuthnot. There are no questions from core participants. Right. <clears throat> well, first of all, Lord Arbuthnot, I assume that there may be persons in the room 
who would like to give you the same sort of appreciation that I precluded them from doing yesterday in the case of this debate. So I'm going to ask them to so show similar restraint today, but that does not mean that I cannot thank you profusely for the efforts you have put in, and in particular, your support for this inquiry, because it should be known that you were one of the first people to engage with the non-statutory review, which was not welcomed by many people, but you thought it appropriate to give it what assistance you could. So throughout my involvement in this process, I have had nothing but help from you, for which I thank you very much. Well, thank you. So thank you. That's um, the end of Lord Arbuthnot's um, uh, evidence. We're going to try something that we haven't done before, which is um, if I can ask for one of the ushers to escort the Lord Arbuthnot from the room and switch remotely to Sir Anthony Hooper. Um, He's not far away, as I understand it. Um, I, I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, you, you don't know where he is, in other words? No. Um, partly because it's all Mr. Blake's um, uh, area of responsibility. Um, right. If we can just keep everyone seated in the room for a moment, there's about a five-minute turnaround to get the screen installed. Um, but we're doing it this way because there's no point in taking our extended break now, having only sat for 35 minutes. Sure.
Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. I should have said sir and sir. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. Um, this afternoon's witness is Sir Anthony Hooper. Um, you have granted Sir Anthony permission to appear remotely uh, from outside of this country. Yes, and I, I facetiously said to um, Mr. Beer that um, Sir Anthony was not too far away, when, of course, I meant the opposite. He's quite far away. He is indeed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Sir Anthony. I'm the usher, and I'm going to take you through the affirmation. Can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you. Please, can you repeat after me? I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sir Anthony. You should have in front of you, on a screen or beside you, a witness statement um, that I has do. the unique reference number WITN 00430100. Um, that is dated the 8th of March of this year, is that correct? Yes, I have it before me. Thank you very much. Could I ask you to turn to the fifth page where there is a statement of truth? Yes. Um, can you confirm that that is your signature? Yes. And can you also confirm that that statement is true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Uh, Subject to two small corrections. Thank you very much. Shall we make those corrections now? W where are the corrections in your statement? Paragraph seven. Yes. In the third line from the bottom, I wrote the figure 25 since I wrote that statement, I've seen uh, evidence which suggests that the figure should be 15. Thank you very much. Uh, and In the last sentence, I suggest, I say that I thought that the, none of the mediations had been successful. That is true. That is what I thought. And, but I have again seen recently documentary evidence which suggests that some had been successful. If so, I knew nothing about it. Thank you very much. That statement will be published on the inquiry's website in due course and forms part of the inquiry's evidence. I'm going to ask you some supplementary questions this afternoon. Um, you'll be well known to the lawyers in this room as a former Court of Appeal judge. Um, you also sat as part of that role in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division, is that correct? Yes, for seven or eight years. Uh, and well, for many, for the whole of my career as a High Court judge and as a Court of Appeal judge. Thank you. You were a High Court judge before you moved to the Court of Appeal, uh, hearing both criminal and civil proceedings, is that correct? Yes. Um, and before that, you were a practicing barrister? Yes. Uh, you retired from the bench in 2012, after nearly 20 years on the bench. Yes. Um, and now, amongst other things, you are the Deputy Chairman of the Ethics Council of Ukraine. I am. Um, I'm going to begin by looking at a document that predates your appointment. Can we please look at poll 00158062, please? Uh, this is an email chain of the 6th of September 2013. Uh, and if we see, if we scroll down to the bottom of this page, we have an e email exchange between Paula Venels and the company secretary, Alwyn Lyons. Uh, and we see there in the third paragraph, it, it says, K. Linnell suggested Anthony Hooper. Uh, he does know and is interested in being considered, although we do not know how much he would cost. Um, do you recall being proposed um, for the role that you subsequently took up by Kay Linnell of the Justice for Subpostmasters Alliance? Yes. Uh, and do you recall how it is that you came to be proposed in that way? I, I think I remember that Kay Linnell and I were on a professional body together, and I think we discussed it. Um, 
Thank you very much. And if we scroll up to the top, we have the response from Paula Vanels. Uh, she says, really help from, helpful. From what I've heard about Hooper, he sounds a good prospect, especially in view of who nominated him, provided we can be reassured that he will be even-handed uh, because of that nomination provenance. Um, if we look at the, the bottom email, please, if we could scroll down to the bottom of the page and over to the next page. We're here in 6th of September 2013, um, over the page, please. There's one other paragraph that I'd like to draw to your attention, and that's the penultimate paragraph. Um, Alwyn Lyon says to Paula Venels, uh, I know Susan, I think that's Susan Crichton, the general counsel, uh, thinks we've made a reasonable start, uh, but that the wrong chair in the eyes of the JFSA or uh, JA must be James Arbuthnot uh, would take us backwards. And if we're going to transition second sight out of the equation, a chair who is strong and will take a decision based on facts, whether it will be in Paul's favor or not, uh, will be a great asset. Uh, just looking at that paragraph, were you aware when you started or when you were approached for the position um, ab about the thinking regarding second sight and the possibility that they might be transitioned out of the equation? Not at all. Um, would that in any way have affected the approach that you took to the role? No, it, it, it would have made the whole mediation process uh, undoable, if I can use that word. Uh, and why was that? Well, they were a central part of the, uh, the process. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the terms of reference uh, for the working group that you chaired. Can we look at poll 00022307, please? Thank you. So these are the terms of reference for the working group. Very briefly, can you just introduce the working group to the inquiry and just tell us what its purpose was? Well, background, of course, was the second sight report and earlier investigations. And if you look not at this document, but the, the other document which emanated from um, the post office, they were saying that they believed the horizon system to be robust, but they were prepared to hear from, uh, through this scheme, from submost masters who took the view that it was not robust, it had serious failings. So it was a scheme designed to see whether or not the complaints from many post office sub SPMs about the workings of Horizon were, were substantiated or not. And how would that relate to, for example, mediation? Well, I think that was the second part of it, is that um, I think the post post office said at least that they, they, they wish to settle or might wish to settle some of the claims. So having gone through the procedure of, of the uh, scheme, uh, then there was uh, an opportunity to mediate. I mean, if, if I can deal with it very, very briefly, the, 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 we had about 150 applications. The applicants um, completed what was called a case questionnaire that was looked at by Second Sight to see whether or not it contained sufficient information uh, for uh, an investigation. And, and that sometimes was sent back. That was often prepared by legal advisors who received some funding for that from the post office. Uh, it, if Second Sight were happy with the um, case questionnaire, we admitted them into the scheme. Uh, that was followed by the post office carrying out an investigation and producing a report. That report then went to us and to me and to the members, but to Second Sight, and Second Sight then prepared uh, uh, what was ultimately to be called a, a CRR, a, a, a case final, a, a case so, a report. I can deal with the problems later, but that, that was the scheme. 
and then there would be a decision as to whether to mediate. The second side would give its uh, view as to whether this was suitable for mediation, uh, and then there would be a vote on it. And there were only two members of the scheme, namely the post office and the GFSA in the form, in the form of, Miss, uh, of Mr. Alan Bates. And uh, so if the two of them couldn't agree, I had to reach a, I had the deciding vote. But I, and we can look at that if you wish to do so, the whole problem of the mediation. That, that's a very helpful introduction. And, and in, in light of that, we can skip through this uh, terms of reference quite quickly. Uh, we have on our screens at the moment um, paragraphs one and two, which sets out the scope and the members. Um, if we scroll down the page, please, we have the objectives of the overall scheme. Um, and then over the page, we have the role of the working group. At the bottom, we have you named as the independent chair. Uh, and then over the page, please, uh, as you've just said, paragraph seven sets out the decision-making process where members shall attempt to agree all decisions uh, unanimously. Um, but if a decision can't be reached, then um, it goes to a vote, and you had the casting vote in the event of disagreement. Uh, there's one paragraph that I would like to ask you about in respect of the terms of reference, and that's paragraph 2.4, which appears on the first page. It says at 2.4, in conducting working group business, post office may act in a manner that promotes its own interests. Likewise, JFSA may act in a manner that promotes the interests of applicants. Uh, are you able to assist us with how you understood that provision? I don't think I ever did understand it. Um, did you understand the process to be an adversarial process, a cooperative process, or, or something else, in theory? In theory, a cooperative process. So paragraph 2.4 wasn't intended to set up some sort of adversarial process with each side pursuing their own interests? No. I, I can't, I, it may have been explained to me at some stage why it was there, but I have no recollection now why it was there. And reading it, it doesn't make much sense to me. It's pretty obvious that the post office are going to look after its own interests, and the JFSA would do likewise. Um, we looked, we, uh, we started today in September 2013 when your name was first mentioned. Uh, these terms of reference we'll see were finalised in March 2014. Uh, in between your appointment and the finalisation of these terms of reference, what was your initial work? Uh, what did that involve? I don't think my work ever changed. Um, I, I didn't know that the, I had... I had forgotten that these were much later, but the, 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 we, the way we, I ran the scheme as the chairman was exactly as I have described, and we started working as soon as we got going in what, October 2013, November? Thank you very much. I'm going to take you to an email exchange in January 2014, so relatively early on in the scheme. Can we look at poll 003014? Four two seven, please. Um, this is a discussion between lawyers at Cartwright, King, and Bond Dickinson. Could we please start by looking at page four, four and over to five? It's the sixteenth of January, twenty fourteen. Um, this is a discussion between um, Harry Bowyer at Cartwright King and Andrew Parsons at Bond Dickinson, and they're referring to various case studies. If we scroll down the page, we can see the, the beginning of the chain actually starts with an email um, between um, Andrew Parsons and Martin Smith. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, and, and it seems as though they're preparing case summaries for you already in January 2014. What was the purpose of those case summaries? I, I, I think these, these are quite outside the scheme, if, if I right here, remember. And please, my, I remind you that this happened a long time ago. Uh, as I remember, there were about four cases in which the 
which were un, uh, had gone past the charge stage and were to go to trial. And I obviously was concerned, uh, not really in my position as a chairman, but simply as someone who wanted to make sure that there were no wrongful convictions. So I think I asked to look uh, at the case summary, and I think I s suggested that it would, I would hope that these four cases would be dropped. That's my memory. Thank you very much. Could we scroll up, please? And, and that is consistent with the, this uh, email that's currently on screen, where um, Andrew Parsons refers to, for example, four cases where it would be useful to set out the next steps in the investigation process and when we expect a summons to be issued. Uh, no, I should add, sorry, if I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I should add that the uh, GFSA uh, was aware of these prosecutions and was anxious, wanted to know what was going on. And I, I, I think I said, well, look, I'll, I'll do my best to see, what, to see if I can give any help in this area. But it was really outside the, the uh, terms of reference of the scheme. Thank you. If we could scroll up, we see a response from Harry Bowyer. And in respect of a number of cases, he refers to the potential need for a, an expert to be instructed. So we see there the case of El Kasabi. And he says, were this an English case and I were prosecuting, I would probably be happier with an expert instructed. If we scroll down, the case of Core, he also says the only way out is an attack on Horizon for which we will need to instruct an expert. And then Darren King, he says again, the obvious way out is an attack on Horizon and an expert will be necessary. Um, thank you. Can we go on um, to the email before in the chain that's on page three, please? There's a response to those summaries from Andrew Parsons of Bond Dickinson. And he says as follows, uh, would it be possible to incorporate these comments into the case summaries so that this information can be passed to Tony Hooper? Uh, this will probably need a little rewording slash bit more contextual information, given that Tony is not aware of the issue with the Horizon expert as yet. Uh, now, that appears to be a reference to the issues that had been identified uh, relating to Gareth Jenkins and Mr. Clark's advice of the summer of 2013, which is well known to this inquiry. Uh, and that advice raised issues with bugs, errors, and defects um, that hadn't been disclosed by Mr. Jenkins uh, when giving his evidence. Uh, were you aware at that stage, so January 2014, of, of any issue that the post office had with their Horizon expert? To the best of my recollection, I was never aware of the issue around Gareth. And uh, it wasn't until I read the paper sent to me for the purpose of making this witness statement that I learned about him and Simon Clark's advice, for example. Um, would you have expected to have been told about that issue um, in the role that you had for the working group? Well, I think if there was going to be total transparency, I ought to have been told, or the working party ought to have been told, that they had abandoned a witness who had given evidence or made statements in a number of criminal cases and that they had abandoned him because he stated something uh, that there were no problems with, with Horizon, which, as I understand reading the papers, was simply not true. Um, so yes, I would have liked to have known it. I'm not sure how much I could have done with it, but I would like to have known it. If you had been told that uh, on the 21st of January 2014, how would it have affected the work that you were undertaking uh, in the scheme? For example, with uh, relation to uh, convicted individuals, sub-postmasters, and the mediation. Yes, it, 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 I'm sure it would have done. I mean, uh, we, we did look at, at convicted um, SPMs, 
And obviously, I suppose it would have helped me to know that, but uh, it, it would depend a bit more on the facts of the, of the individual case. Thank you. I'm going to look at some meeting notes. Can we start with poll 0010335, please? This is a note of a meeting of the 24th of February 2014 uh, with Paula Venels and Chris Ojard of the Post Office. Um, can you assist us? The paragraph one refers to it being an off-the-record meeting. Uh, do you recall the, the background to this meeting, who, who asked for it and who asked for it to be off the record? No. Uh, were those kinds of meetings with the post office uh, typical, expected, or, or something else? For, for meetings to be one-on-one -on -one without, for example, the other members of the... Uh, oh, no, yeah. I made it clear to the working group that I was from time to time meeting um, Paula Venels. Thank you. If, if we could look at paragraph two, and I'm going to just read out some of the, the second half of that paragraph. Um, it says there, um, it was also explained that the cost of the scheme was currently running at, about, uh, at around £5 million, and that Second Sight had estimated the compensation costs could be up to £50 million. The scheme had therefore moved a long way from its initial positioning as something uh, the outcome of which in many cases might be an apology and or a small gratuitous payment. Um, what do you recall in, in relation to the reference there to um, the scheme, the cost of the scheme being far greater than it had been anticipated? Well, I think, again, from memory, conversations about a small gratuitous statement, I think I made it clear that it, wouldn't, it would be much more than a small gratuitous payment in some cases. And, and did you understand when you took on the role uh, that it would be something less significant or more significant than had been anticipated? Well, I mean... <laughs> They were very early days when I took on the role. I, what I knew about the, what we now is the post office scandal, came from reading Private Eye, Computer Weekly, and obviously following um, what Lord Arbuthnot, now Lord Arbuthnot, and his fellow MPs were saying. I had very little knowledge uh, other than that. Uh, so I wasn't in a position at the outset to say it would be a small amount or a large amount. But when you look at the figures involved, the one I mentioned in my statement, 60,000, um, it wasn't likely to be a small payment. And to what extent were costs matters that were raised by the post office in conversations you had with them over the years, the cost of the scheme? Well, I, I, I'm sure from time to time they complained about the cost of the scheme, but that, that wasn't the cause of our problems. We started today um, by looking at that reference to second sight and the possibility of taking them out of the equation. Uh, by the time of, of this meeting, the 24th of February 2014, can you assist us with the relationship between second sight and the post office so far as you saw it? I, I don't think it had really broke. We're still in 2014, so I don't think it had really broken down at this stage. It broke down later. Uh, I told you how it worked. So the post office would produce an investigation report, and then Second Sight became disenchanted and, and very critical of those investigating reports and criticised them, and then we would send it back to the post office to try and improve. The other side of the coin was that when the um, Second Sight produced its case uh, review report, the post office were very critical uh, uh, of the contents of the report. Uh, I also uh, was concerned um, in the case of both the post office and the uh, second site reports that we weren't really looking at the loss. Um, uh, I, I wanted to follow the money. I wanted to know what was the loss and how could that loss have occurred. So working, in a sense, 
together, uh, the reports gradually improved. But as the, the post office became uh, opposed, many of the second site reports, they thought they were going too far out. They criticized the second site. I mean, the one that's referred to in the papers is when second site said um, false accounting is a less serious offense than theft. And that I see in all the papers led to all kinds of lawyers being involved. But that's exactly what I'd said in a meeting. I, um, so <laughs> there were just conflicts gradually grew and grew and grew and grew uh, until uh, we were finally closed down in March 2015. So I can't tell you at what stage it disintegrated. It was a slow disintegration. I'll be taking you through some of the meeting notes to see that disintegration. Um, if we could start on, on this document and look down at paragraph four, please. Um, the discussion between yourself and Paula Venels, you say there, um, it says there that uh, TH, that's yourself, agreed that Second Sight were very resource challenged and it would be difficult for them uh, to meet the current timetable. Can you assist us with the reference to uh, resource challenges, please? Well, uh, remind, uh, you, you all know better than I am. S Second sight were two people, and then they brought in, I think, one, possibly more assistance. We had 150 cases coming through. Two people would find it very difficult to turn around the case review reports, as well as doing their work on the... Uh, case questionnaires in the, t in the time that we wanted them to do it. Uh, and was that because there were more cases than anticipated or because um, Second Sight had been instructed with, uh, for example, too few individuals um, assisting them? I, I, I can't tell you about the second. Uh, I'm sure we had much more work than was anticipated. It then they, were a, they were a very small company, uh, uh, and, and I, I praise them for all the work that they did, and obviously I worked closely with them, but uh, there was no way they could keep up. Did the number of cases take you by surprise? I, not really, in the sense that I, I just didn't know. I didn't know how many would come forward. The paragraph continues, that said, um, your view was that Second Sight were trying to be objective and that they had a difficult path to tread, in, that in order uh, to their job properly, in, in your view, uh, they would need to express an opinion on the merits of each claim. Uh, in your view, this was something that they found hard to do. Um, just pausing there, can you assist us with, with, with that, please? Oh. These were very complex and difficult cases that we were looking at and that they were looking at. And throughout the whole of the time of the mediation scheme, the post office were maintaining over and over again that the horizon system was robust. There was nothing wrong with it. And so when you were producing a report, when you're looking at an applicant's case, it's understandable that you would want to say something about the merits. Uh, as I say in my witness statement, I tried to make it clear to Paul Reynolds and um, to the chair chairman that the post office case didn't make sense. And I, I felt that throughout, and no doubt Second Sight did. It didn't make sense that reputable SPMs appointed by the post office after an examination of their characters would be stealing these sums of money. It didn't make sense, in particular because within a matter of days of any, quote, alleged theft, unquote, they had to balance the books. It's, it just never made sense. I made that point over and over again. Can you assist us with how you made that point? Was it in discussions, one-on-one -on -one discussions in groups? Yes, yes. 
<laughs> but it was absolutely obvious. And who did you communicate that to? Uh, both Paul Reynolds and um, Al I've forgotten the, the, the chairman's second name. Was it Alice Perkins? Jim. Yeah, or that's right. Yeah. But it's why it's why Lord Arbuthnot and the MPs got involved because it didn't make sense. Continuing, sticking with that paragraph, uh, some concern was expressed by Paula Venels and Chris Ojard that Second Sight uh, were, had not in their correspondence come across as independent and may be unduly influenced by the need to satisfy certain MPs. Um, was that a view that was communicated to you? And well, I, apparently I was at, was I at the meeting? Yes, yes. Th this is the meeting with you. Well, they, they may have been said, I would have, I would have refuted it completely. They were being very independent. They were just coming to conclusions which the post office didn't like. Thank you. Uh, paragraph five, various options were discussed and it seems as though the post office was suggesting uh, a number of different options. One was terminating the scheme, uh, two, restructuring the scheme, three, augmenting Second Sight's resources, uh, four, reworking the process in the scheme and streamlining it. And then we move on. It says, um, TH's strong contention was that the post office should take no precipitous action until such time as Second Sight had produced, say, five reports and until we had seen their thematic report. He noted the adverse PR consequences of terminating the scheme and also offered to make himself uh, available to talk to the board to explain why he considered uh, this approach appropriate, uh, should that be necessary or desirable. Uh, do you recall saying that? Is that a fair reflection of the words that you spoke? Very much so. Very much so. I thought it was ridiculous to close down the scheme at this stage when we were still at the very early stage. As you can see from that paragraph, Second Sight hadn't produced as, as many as five reports. We were waiting for that. So we're very early days. And to close it down would, was, would have been ridiculous. Um, you are perhaps today more animated than that paragraph suggests. Uh, is that because the paragraph is downplaying um, the words that you spoke, or, or were you more measured in your discussions in, that <laughs> I don't. are expressed? I'm not, I mean, I'm not always very. I'm not always very measured. <laughs> uh, do you think in that meeting you? Uh, you, you spoke as forcefully as you are speaking today. I, I don't know. I'm prepared to take this strong contention. That's, that's good enough. I was opposed to, to closing the scheme down at that early stage. We note there that you have offered to talk to the board to explain. Um, were you ever taken up on that offer? Was it ever suggested to you that you could speak to the board? No, sadly I wasn't. I, I, I think looking back on it all, it's a shame I didn't say I'd like to speak to the board. I'd like to have got over to the board, who I knew were giving Paul and Reynolds a hard time. I'd like to get over to them the fundamental implausibility of the post office case. You say that they were giving Paula Venels a hard time. What was your understanding of that? Well, I, I remember her saying, well, the, the board were looking for more, you know, for, uh, were concerned about the cost. They didn't think it was going anywhere. Uh, their view, uh, Horizon was robust. There was nothing wrong with Horizon. These were all, uh, these cases had no merit. I, I'm, I'm putting it in very general terms. That was the feeling I got from her, whether rightly or wrongly. Uh, and were any names mentioned in that regard? If they were, I certainly couldn't remember today. Okay. Um, moving on to paragraph seven, it says the quantum of compensation payments was discussed. And I think this is the paragraph that you were referring to earlier. It says that you noted uh, that the applicant's questionnaires often painted a very distressing picture uh, where there had been a loss of livelihood and other losses. Uh, your view was that should the evidence show that the post office had not acted properly, then the amount of compensation payable could be quite material. 
and it says, note that this contradicts the legal advice obtained by the post office from Bond Dickinson, uh, which categorically states that the maximum loss the post office could expect to pay would be limited to three months pay under the sub-postmaster's contract. It's not entirely clear uh, whether you had in mind criminal cases only when you made those comments. W what did you have in mind when you made those comments? Both, both civil and criminal. If someone had been sued, what, what was the, the man who went to the High Court and was ordered to pay £300,000 of cost to the post office? I, I can't remember the exact case. But all those who had lost their livelihood, I didn't think it was, the result was going to depend on some minute reading of a contract. And did you make that clear in that meeting or in other meetings? I, I made it clear that there would be, there would probably have to be substantial payments. I mean, when one looks at the newspaper today, we're talking about over half a million. Was the advice from Bond Dickinson ever shared with you? Were you ever told that the post office expected to pay far less? Well, I was obviously, uh, I, I don't remember. I, I probably was told that that they had not expected to pay a lot. I was probably told that. Um, I don't think I saw any Bond Dickinson advice, and I, I don't know how, how what, what they founded that advice on. I'm going to move to a number of meetings of the working group. Can we start with poll 00026656, please? And we're now in, on the 7th of March, 2014. And we see there, if we scroll down, that's when the terms of reference were agreed. Was it likely that there were several meetings before this meeting, or was this the first official meeting? I would have thought there must have been meetings before March. I'd be very surprised if that was the first meeting. And can we please turn to page four, where there is reference to the second site report. So you've talked us through already the difference, uh, the process that is involved, where there is a post office investigation report, first a questionnaire, then a post office investigation report, uh, and the final report is a second site report. Is that correct? Yes, bearing in mind that as we processed, progressed, the, we sent the report back to the post office to deal with the complaints made by Second Sight, and we sent second, the Second Sight reports back to Second Sight to meet the complaints made by the post office. So it, it wasn't an easy, smooth process. It says there, the working group had agreed as a temporary procedure for the first three or four Second Sight reports that it would review the reports alongside the post office investigation reports to satisfy itself that the package of information would provide the mediator with what was necessary for a successful mediation. Yes. And then it refers there to second site reports, and these are things that we will see over the course of this phase of the inquiry, reference to M numbers. Those are the reports that are produced by second site, are they? Or yes. the, case, the case reference? Well, no, no, M was the, the number of the applicant. Thank you. Um, and, um, the, and I should add, I, I think it is clear somewhere in the papers that it, it was not our um, task to look at the merits. Um, it, it says there that as a result of the discussion, the working group agreed um, that the second site reports needed to be revisited, and it sets that out there. C can you give us your initial impressions of both the second site reports and the post office investigation reports as to the, their qualities? I think that's a, a, a very hard question. Um, I, I wanted the second sight reports, as it says there in A, to really concentrate on the losses and the surplus so that the mediation, uh, the mediator could understand what was the amount of money involved. So uh, I was stressing that. In, in the case of the post office reports, I, I'm sure I was critical of those from time to time as to not being clear as to what they were saying. But uh, the, the, the post office reports essentially was nothing wrong with Horizon. This is either theft or carelessness. Thank I mean, you. That was all, I, I, I haven't 
got one in front of me and I haven't looked at one for years, but my memory of the last, the conclusion was always nothing wrong with Horizon, Horizon robust, this must be either theft or some form of carelessness. Or Can we please turn to poll 00026643? This is another meeting of the working group. We're now on the 13th of March, 2014. That's, if you look over, if we turn over the page, it has the date there. Um, on on the, that page, second page, if we scroll down, we can see various cases and their status. And it seems as though extensions have been granted in a large number of cases. Uh, and if we scroll, keep on scrolling down. No, let's, just, let's just stop there for a moment. Yes. So... That is M005, investigation report by the post office, extension granted because they weren't ready to do it, that that was not the first extension. We spent a lot of our time trying to hurry the process up, but being realistic, we had to give extensions, both to post office and you'll see also to second site. Uh, absolutely. If we scroll down, we can see comments from Alan Bates below, if we keep on scrolling, thank you, it says AB, I be believe that's Alan Bates, noted the number of extensions being requested by post office and queried whether that was at odds with the approach being taken with professional advisers, um, and that's Angela van der Bogard is looking into how this process can be made more efficient, but some cases are taking longer to investigate due to the complexity of the issues raised. Uh, what, what did you recall? No, re and the next, sorry, if you could read the next sentence. Um, in, in and it says that you pointed out that the working group had not declined any extension request made by professional advisers, only required that such requests uh, should be put to the working group to consider before the expiry of the deadline. And in that regard, the post office and professional advisers are being dealt with in an even manner. Uh, you said that the working group will expect to see progress with... Uh, post office investigations next week. So th that shows you that we were giving extensions to the professional advisors who were not keeping to our time limits, extensions to the post office and extensions to second site. Uh, and in your view and to your recollection, were they fairly equal in terms of uh, it was all parties equally uh, seeking extensions? Did one seek more extensions than the other? Were, were you unhappy with one more than the other, or were they all equally in the same position? Well, at this stage, you're dealing with the investigation reports. As we move through the minutes, you'll see that the investigation reports are complete, and they were giving extensions to second site. Yes. It, I, I, mean, I, I don't think there was any uh, a, a question of favouring one rather than the other. We were just doing our best, all of us, to try and get this things complete. Did the complexity um, take you or others by surprise at the length of time that was required? No, I don't think it did. Um, the, these, some of these cases went back to 2005, 2006, so there was an absence of paperwork, uh, on perhaps on both sides, where post SPMs had lost paperwork, obviously, had given up. There was difficulties with the paperwork in the post office. Again, I mean, the, the, the criticism, as we all know, is that when the SPMs originally made their complaints years ago about their this sudden loss that appeared, that that wasn't properly investigated. and. and that's almost certainly right. But the consequence was, when we came to look at it, there weren't the documents that one might have expected to be there if it had been properly looked at. So was one of the difficulties uh, and one of the delays caused by a, a, uh, a failing in the original investigation by the post office investigators rather than an investigation during uh, this mediation process? Well, I know that now because I've read the judgment of Mr. Justice Fraser. And I know that there were these peaks and kells available which w were uh, not um, looked at at the time, error logs. I don't know if I knew that during this 
doing the mediation scheme. And obviously, I've learned a huge amount uh, following uh, my ending, ending my chairmanship. Thank you. Can we scroll down, please, over to the next page, page four? And there's just one entry that I'd like to ask you about. It says there, the first bullet point, uh, AH had prepared a note setting out a proposed structure for second sites reports. Uh, the working group discussed the note and agreed it was helpful. So it seems as though you produced a note in order to assist second site with the structure of their reports. Yes. It's to be helpful because if a med I was looking at it from the point of view of a mediator. A mediator looking at a, a report wants to have it in a sort of structured way so that he or she can understand what the issues are. Uh, Second Sight were extremely busy. They were overloaded. Uh, and I was doing my bit to try and help to get their reports uh, in, in a way that would be easily understandable and readable by the mediator. Thank you. Can we please look at, at an email? It's UKGI 00002221. It's an email um, from Richard Callard of the Shareholder Executive, dated the 25th of March. I'm just going to read to you um, the fir first bit of that first paragraph, uh, which follows a read. It's a readout of a meeting with Paula Venels, so between Paula Venels and the Shareholder Executive. Uh, it says, apparently, Chair Tony Hooper has sent the second site reports back to them to be rewritten. He considered them to be substandard and unsubstantiated. And then it says, not sure uh, those were his precise words, but the sentiment was certainly there. And Tony Hooper uh, has also decided to give second site his idea of what the general framework paper should cover. So clearly, his faith in second site is waning. Uh, whilst we could capitalize on this, uh, Paula is a bit worried of forcing the point too much, i.e. Uh, we should let him draw his own conclusions. He might start to rebel if he feels he is being pushed in that direction. Um, is that a fair and accurate reflection of, uh, of your position? Do you, do you think that not that's... At all, not at all. I did not think they were substantive, standard. I didn't think they were unsubstantiated. I didn't have... My faith in SS was not waning. I just thought the reports could be written more clearly. Do you recall Paula Venel's, um, a discussion with Paula Venel's on those issues at all? I, I'm, there probably was. And can you assist us with why you consider it may be that uh, there's a difference in opinion between the two of you regarding that discussion? Well, I, I can't help you. Um, I know there's one meeting where I expressed, I'm recorded as having expressed some concern as the second site going outside the ambit. Uh, I don't remember why I said that. I don't remember what led me to, to say that. But I had faith in second site right until the end. I just wanted them to, to make reports that were more easily readable for the mediator. Uh, and we saw... And I wasn't concerned with the merits. Don't forget, I, 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 I doubt I would have said unsubstantiated because I wasn't concerned with the merits. I was concerned with the form. We saw at the very beginning of your evidence today that mention to um, trying to transition second sight out of the equation. Uh, by this stage, so March 2014, uh, were you aware of the post office's intentions towards the continuation of Second Sight? No, not at all. No, I, I didn't know that they, no. I mean, I knew that the post office were very unhappy because they didn't like the conclusions that were being drawn. Can we please look at UKGI 00019286, please? And it's a letter of the 16th of April 2014 from Alan Bates to Joe Swinson, uh, the mm -hmm. then Minister uh, for Postal Affairs. Uh, and he there expresses some uh, concerns about the progress of the initial case review and mediation scheme. 
Um, if we perhaps look at a, just a few extracts from the third page. Uh, we see there it says, yet to date the post office has not finalized a single case report uh, to the point where it's ready for the working group to consider its suitability for being sent to mediation uh, and realistically uh, that could still be a considerable time off. Uh, to what extent at that stage did you agree with uh, the words that were said there. Well, I'm assuming that uh, Alan is right when he says they hadn't fit finalised a single case report to that point, but they certainly did in 2014 and 2015 finalise many reports. We'll see references in due course to, to matters speeding up or progress being made, but at this particular stage, so um, April 2014, so the spring of 2014, uh, did you have concerns about the speed of the post office in producing their case reports? Yes, of course I did. Uh, we all did. And that's why we, can, we, we gave them time limits. We, we granted extensions. To, uh, we listened to their work out. We put uh, a, a considerable degree on of pressure on the post office to finalise their reports, as we were to do later, when we put considerable pressure on um, Second Sight to finish theirs, and indeed, as we did with the advisors, we put pressure on them to bring the, the, the material that we needed. If we scroll down, please, to the fourth paragraph, he says there, to me, and trying to be objective, the main hold-up is with the post office, at the time of writing, not one case report by them has been completed and submitted to Second Sight in a way that Second Sight can complete its own case review report. Um, as he mentioned earlier, Post Office first became aware of the details um, from September 2013, but they're constantly seeking extensions, etc. And then if we scroll down to that penultimate paragraph, he says, uh, at a recent working group meeting chaired by yourself, two case reports uh, that the post office were preparing for submission to Second Sight were analysed in order to examine whether the format of the report met the requirements. Uh, during the in-depth discussion analysis of the data and evidence, it was abundantly clear to me and I think many others at the table that if any investigation had taken part at the actual time of the incidents, then the outcome would have been very different in certainly one, uh, if not both, cases. Um, was that a view that you shared at that point? I can't remember about those two cases. It was certainly a view I shared. But I'd, I'd like just to go back to the, the, what you quote before. I, I, I did not feel, do not feel, that the post office were dragging their feet in preparing the reports. They were very difficult to prepare. Uh, I often talked to Angela van der Bogard and others about the complexities. I tried to help see what, how we could speed things up. But I would not like it to be thought that I agreed with Alan in the sense that they were deliberately dragging their feet. That was not the situation. There was too much work. Thank you. Can we look at poll 00203701, please? Uh, this is an email exchange with Second Sight uh, in April and into May of that year. If we start with the final page, please, page four. Um, you seem there to be mediating between Second Sight and, and others in the sense that um, you say halfway through your email there that, as you've said before, if they're dissatisfied with a post office report, then they should explain that in their report, uh, where they're dissatisfied, and leave it to the mediator. Um, can you assist us there with, with your concerns? Well, I think trying to speed things up, but what, the, the danger was that we'd just go back and forth. Second Sight would criticize the post office report, then the post office would look at it again and make a change, and then it would come back again. And, and I think probably what I was trying to do there was move things on by saying, look, if you're not happy with it, explain why you're not happy with it, and then leave it to the mediator. I think I was trying to speed things up. That, that's, uh, and it, I believe, what I was trying to do. If we scroll up, we see a, a lengthy response from Ron Warmington of Second Sight, and he explains, for example, he gives a couple of 
different case references on page two. There we go. If we stop there, uh, MO54, if we look at the final, the, end, the very bottom of this page, he says that in that case, um, the regret, if we scroll down, please, uh, the regrettable, it's the very end of the page now, so if we could scroll down a little bit more. Uh, this regrettable delay is a direct consequence of the post office failing to conduct a proper investigation either at the time or when preparing its uh, investigation report. And then he refers to another one, uh, M127, where the report contains a lot of brand new material and much of it poses new questions, some of which, as it happens, we've already put to the applicant but they may need to be other questions that will need to be answered. Can you give us a sense of the, the various frustrations on, on all sides uh, with regards to the scheme and, and the speed at which things were being actioned? Yes, of course. If we look at the first page, you say to... I mean, that, that page is just typical of the debates we were having and of the complications of trying to sort things out. Yes, and I think if we scroll to the first page, you say that uh, you, you'd like to draw that specific email to the attention of the working group. If we scroll, yes, I, scroll down. Yes, that's right. I think I didn't I put a copy of the email before the working group so that we could discuss it. Uh, absolutely. And in fact, I'll take you to the minutes of that working group and that will be the final document that I take you to before we take our mid-afternoon break. Can we just look at poll 00043627 please? Um, so there are a number of matters raised at this particular meeting in May 2014. Um, it begins um, by discussing the draft part one report that had been tabled by Second Sight. And you can see there a number of generic points were made by the post office. Uh, they say the starting point for the report did not ring true as the draft was set up as a supporting document for the thematic report, and that was not the purpose of the document. Uh, opinions should be taken out of the document and moved into the Second Sight thematic report. The penultimate one says uh, there are sections of analysis and conjecture in the document which need to be moved to the part two report where again they will need to be supported by evidence. Can you give us a sense of uh, the strength of the post office's feeling towards that first draft report by Second Sight? Uh, I, I, it's accurately reflected there. They were, they were unhappy with it. Uh, and what was your view? Well, I was an independent chairman. Uh, I, I was not in a position to, 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 to make an ass assessment. I was trying to be independent, so I would want to listen to what um, Second Sight said about it. Can you give us an idea of the, the atmosphere within the meetings themselves by this stage? And was there a oh, sense of... No, I, I think generally civilised, generally... Um, you know, there was no shouting or arguing. People were making their points. But, you know, we look at all this stuff in great detail. But the post office would not budge from their position that the horizon system was robust. If you take that as your starting point, that there is nothing wrong with horizon, that anything which tends to criticize the way that the post office handled a particular case or how uh, the, the evidence supporting a particular applicant's um, case, it, it, it's going to be criticized because it's got to be wrong. Why has it got to be wrong? Because in the view of the post office, there's nothing wrong. The system is robust. We now know it wasn't robust. And we, we can very quickly look at the second item agenda over the page, which is a case M022. Uh, and you say there, it says, it says there that the chair opened the discussion 
um, by inviting the working group to comment on the report style only and not on content. Uh, and below that, it sets out various concerns that the post office raised about that particular case study. Um, they say the report was not of satisfactory quality. If we scroll down, they say neutral language needs to be used uh, throughout the whole document. The document needs to clearly balance the evidence used without any counterpoint brought forward. This is often absent at the moment. Um, if we scroll down over the page, they say the scope of the report goes beyond Second Sight's area of expertise, for example, commenting on whether or not a case was suitable for police investigation. Is this an example, as, as you've just said, of uh, a mindset that is um, uh, assumes that there is no problem with the system and therefore finds fault in the underlying reports, or is there something no, else? No, that's my view. If you, if you take the view that there's nothing wrong with Horizon, then any criticisms of the way that an applicant's case was handled are likely to be not met with favour by the post office. Thank you. What was not happening, as I make clear in my report, as I understand it, there was never an in-depth investigation of, of Horizon. What we were doing here was looking at individual cases. But because of the age of the cases sometimes, because of the, the many complications, you weren't going to find the smoking gun in any individual case. That, that, that was the problem throughout. Uh, and very briefly, um, just before we break, or if we scroll down, we can see there, as you've said, the correspondence between yourself and Second Sight is referred to there. Uh, so, so that email chain... It's brought. exactly the other side of the picture. Yes. And if we scroll down, you also addressed at that meeting page four, the bottom of page four, the correspondence between Alan Bates and the minister, which we've just been looking at as well. Um, the post office there seemed to raise a number of concerns about that letter. If we scroll down, um, they felt that he had broken the confidentiality, factual inaccuracies, etc. And then Mr. Bates comments on that below. Second site comment below that. Um, it says, in closing, the chair commented that he felt that Alan had not been fair to the post office over their investigation reports and he would write to that effect. C can you assist us with that? I mean... I did. I, th I felt that and, and, and I, I told Alan that I thought that he'd been a little unfair. Not about... And we're not talking here about... Uh, the merits. We're talking about procedure. I thought it was not fair to say that the post office were, were uh, unduly delaying their investigation reports. I felt the post office were seeking, insofar as each individual report is concerned, was seeking to deal with it in, in the time that they, that they needed. So I, I didn't think Alan had been fair to them, and I said that. There are... And I was right because late, later on, the second site had huge... Um, we had to grant them numerous extensions because, again, uh, the amount of work that was involved. But this has nothing to do with the merits. This is all to do with procedure. And with regards to procedure, were the various positions quite entrenched by that stage? Or, or were... Well, I, I did my... <laughs> I spent my time over the, what, 18 months I was a chair, trying to resolve these issues as well as I possibly could. And, um, and what did you see as the barriers to resolving those problems? Or, or the principal barrier to resolving those problems? Uh, <laughs> the barrier was that the, the, the post office would not accept any problems with Horizon. Thank you very Therefore, much. Everything, nothing could really happen. I mean, we, we could look at an individual case and say, well, maybe there ought to be some compensation or a mediator could say that. But if you don't accept any problems at all with Horizon, 
then how can you resolve th these individual cases? Now, it's not the need to say when post office realized that there were, I, I read lots about it, at what stage they knew what and how much they knew, that's nothing to do with me. All I'm saying is that this mediation scheme couldn't ultimately succeed because the post office was saying there was no problem with Horizon. Uh, and now we know, as I quote in my statement, the admissions, for example, before the Court of Appeal Criminal Division, where uh, Mr. Altman, now King's Counsel, uh, admitted gross failures in the Horizon system. None of that came out during the mediation scheme. The impression I get, Sir Anthony, is that on day one, shall we say, the post office had an entrenched view as to um, the robustness of Horizon. And by the last day of um, the scheme, that view had simply remained unchanged. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So can we take our mid-afternoon break now and, and come back at 3.45, please? Yes, of course. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So can you see and hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. I, I'd like to add something to my last answer in reply to the chairman's comment. It, that approach affects everything. So even if the post office were to accept that the investigation could have been done better back in 2006 or 10 than it was done, it made no difference because Horizon was right. So even if they made the investigation, Horizon was perfect, so it would have made no difference. And that spills over into the criminal cases, which, as we know from the decision of the Court of Appeal criminal decision, where prosecutors were making it a condition of accepting a plea to false accounting, that there was no criticism of the post office. Why? Because the Horizon system was perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. In light of the evidence that you've already given this afternoon, I'm going to speed through very quickly the, the rest of the chronology of the working group so that we can move on to um, some small issues of um, differences in legal opinions. Um, I'm going to start this afternoon by looking at a poll. Let's actually, let's... Let's start with UKGI 00002385, please. Very briefly look at an email from June 2014. Uh, this is an email, um, internal email in the shareholder executive, if we could scroll down, and it discusses a board paper. It's a post office board paper. I don't need to take you to that board paper. Um, for those who are... Uh, keeping a note, the reference to the board paper itself is poll 00205354. Um, Mr. Batten says there, the paper references progress is picking up pace, and that's, I think, the evidence that you previously given, that things sped up as time went on. Um, he says, for poll, the post office, this is a catalyst for change, but it presents a difficulty in terms of handling i.e., why is the post office changing now that progress is finally being made? What are they hiding? Uh, it also presumably makes it harder to secure Anthony Hooper's support for change, particularly, as he suggests, 18 months is not unreasonable. Uh, just pausing there, were you aware, as at June 2014, of a plan uh, to change the process or commitment by the post office or the shareholder executive to then change the process? Well, no, but you've shown me a, a discussion I had with um, Paul of Ennels in which mention of change was made, but I, I, I didn't know that it went any further than a discussion. I certainly didn't know that any sort of tentative decisions were being made to make uh, changes. Thank you. And that continues to say, separately, November 2015 is after the election uh, which is enticing to ministers who can point to an established process between now and the election. Uh, were you aware of any political dimensions to the continuation of the scheme? Certainly not. Can we now please turn to poll 00148863? And we're now in August 2014. Poll 00148863. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I believe it should be 8863. Poll 00148863. Thank you very much. Um, this is an email from Roderick Williams to yourself, the uh, post office lawyer to yourself, and it relates to the final version of Second Sight's Part 2 report. Uh, and he says there, further to my email yesterday, we have now received the final version of Second Sight's Part 2 report. Um, he says, the report still includes matters that are beyond the scheme's scope, um, etc. So um, Second Sight had produced a first version, which had then been subject subject to um, feedback from the post office, and they have now produced what, what is said to be the final version. And if we scroll down to the bottom of this page, please, 
he says as follows, I understand that the working group's terms of reference provide that where the working group cannot reach a unanimous decision, the chair may, may define the point of disagreement and call a vote. As a unanimous decision over the report appears unlikely, Post Office respectfully requests that the chair call for a vote on Thursday's call on the following resolution. One, that the report not be released as currently drafted. Two, alternatively, that if the report is to be released as currently drafted, that the working group notes Post Office will, as a party, not a member of the working group, write to each applicant who receives the report, setting out the Post Office's position on the report. And it goes over the page to say, I therefore ask your consent to defer release of the report until next Thursday's working group call so that this resolution can be discussed and voted upon, uh, which will provide Post Office with the opportunity to explain its position and, if appropriate, explore with the working group any potential alternatives. Uh, can you assist us with what you recall of this issue? No. Um, 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 I, I think there's a, a minute which we can look at where this was discussed. But um, Would you have seen it as within your remit um, as, as chair of that group to delay Second Sight's part two report? Well, if I'm asked by the post office to, to delay it until a few days later, the working group, of course, I would agree to that. Can we, I'll take you to a document that you may be referring to. It's poll 00207914. And it's an email that refers to what ultimately happened. And it's the second substantive paragraph. If we could scroll down, please. It says... Sir Anthony Hooper, despite our attempts to delay the issue of the report until the working group had an opportunity to discuss it with a view to improving it, uh, he decided that the report should be issued to those applicants and advisers whose cases in the opinion of Second Sight are referenced to uh, the content of the report. Consequently, the report was sent to nine applicants, um, etc., uh, and it says there that the post office wrote to the recipients of the report <coughs> to advise them that the report was not endorsed by the post office. But it, was the matter discussed at a working group? It, it doesn't seem to be, it's certainly not suggested in that email. Uh, I don't have. Yeah. I'm surprised it wasn't discussed at a working group before I took that decision, but there it is, I may have done. Um, is there anything that you recall of, of, of that particular issue? Well, I rec obviously recall the issue when I read about it. It was a very hot topic. Um, but uh, as you can see, I, I, I think whether we had a vote or not, I, I simply can't remember. But I, I definitely made the decision that's outlined there. And do you recall why you made that decision? I wasn't to do with the, the merits. I was, I was concerned with procedure. I was concerned that Second Sight... Um, they produce their report, and that report goes out. And did you have any concerns about the delay of the report, or a delay to the report? And I, I, I probably did. But I'd like, I would obviously like to look at a minute, to, if there is one, in which this was discussed, and I, I can't remember. Can we... Please turn to UKGI 00000032. We're moving forward now to March 2015 and, and the end of the end, uh, yes. The working group. This is a ministerial submission uh, to Joe Swinson, the then minister. I'm just going to read you a, a few a extracts from this submission. If we scroll down, please, to the summary at two and three, it says, it is becoming increasingly apparent that the scheme is not working in the way it was intended. So who is, who is, who is this from? Um, this is from Laura Thompson, who, who I presume is an official within the department. Getting your information from the post office. Um, well, that's... I presume. That's Not something that I will, I, I will ask you about. Um, yes, all right. If we look at paragraph two, 
the summary there that's presented to the minister is it is becoming increasingly apparent that the scheme is not working in the way it was intended and is taking too long uh, to progress to mediation for applicants. Uh, the post office report confidentially that the Justice for Sub Postmasters <coughs> Alliance are refusing to engage in the working group. Certain MPs have publicly withdrawn their support and both the JFSA and MPs supporting them are increasingly critical of the post office. Next, Can we take that please line by line? Um, I'd like, because of the time, I'd like to read you a few paragraphs and then you can take well, it... Uh, as long as you don't think I'm accepting that, what said there. Well, absolutely not. In fact, the question that I'm going to ask you at the end is the extent to which you accept that it's accurate or not. Um, so perhaps we'll, we'll look at a few paragraphs uh, and then um, we can revisit this particular page. Paragraph three says, whilst the delays are due in some part to the complexity of the cases, and the depth of the investigations by both the post office and second site. Uh, they also arise from pressure from the JFSA, MPs and second site to widen the scope of the scheme, uh, given that there has been no smoking gun found to date on horizon. Uh, second site are attempting to explore issues outside their remit or indeed expertise, uh, such as sub postmasters contracts and the post office's prosecutions policy, rather than focusing their efforts on the individual cases uh, they were appointed to investigate. Uh, if we scroll over the page, just two more paragraphs that I will read. It's paragraph four and paragraph five. Uh, paragraph four says, uh, from the post office's point of view, the investigation and mediation scheme has demonstrated that there is no evidence of systemic flaws in Horizon and no evidence that any of the convictions are unsafe. Uh, where post office may have fallen down in individual cases is on training and support, and they are addressing those issues uh, which have not already been picked up. Uh, paragraph five, the post office's board have agreed that effective from next week, they will announce that the post office will adopt a presumption of mediating all non-criminal cases uh, remaining in the scheme, except in some very exceptional circumstances, this will render redundant the role of the working group, so it will be closed. Um, looking at, at what I've just read, is that submission to the minister accurate, or does it accurately reflect the position uh, so far as you saw it at that time? Could you go back to paragraph two, please? Absolutely. The scheme was working as it was intended. It was taking too long, but we were dealing with the problem, uh, putting pressure on both Second Sight and the Post Office to produce the reports that they had to produce. It is not true that GFSA were refusing to engage in the working group. What is true is that there was an issue over mediation. Scheme envisaged that Second Sight would produce their report and then a decision would be made by the working group as to whether it was suitable for mediation. I took the view originally that because the post office and the JFSA couldn't agree as members, that I would opt for mediation if I thought that there was a reasonable chance that mediation would succeed. Alan Bates of JFSA persuaded me that that was a wrong approach. I looked more carefully at the origins of the scheme and what MPs had been told, and I changed my test to a much wider test. JFSA refused to take part in the discussions that the rules required us to have as to whether or not there should be mediation. So effectively, they would absent themselves from the room, which put a lot of pressure on me because I had to try and work out on my own without any submissions from them as to whether it was appropriate to go to mediation. That, as I recollect, is the only uh, time in which they refused to engage. So it was a pretty minor matter, and it was being resolved by me exercising a casting vote uh, and uh, 
I think towards the end, we were more often than not, uh, I was deciding that it should go to mediation and give my written reasons for doing it. It is true to say, I'm sure, that MPs have publicly withdrawn their support. And it's true to say that they were increasingly critical of poll. I accept that. Thus, um, paragraph three, I find that difficult because if you're looking at an individual case, then it's inevitable that you're going to look slightly wider. But you see there, uh, uh, there has been no smoking gun. So there was nothing that was strong enough to show that, we, as we now know, that Horizon was not a robust system and had many bugs and errors and allowed Fujitsu even to um, change things, uh, change the entries. So I had some sympathy for Second Sight for, for widening it, but that was a matter that could be controlled by me if I felt that they were going too far. Paragraph four. Ah, well, there you are. Demonstrated no evidence of systemic flaws in, in Horizon. Therefore, nothing. All convictions are safe, all of which we know now is to be complete rubbish. And the rest is announcing the closure. I was... You, you, I, 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 yes, go on. Uh, sorry, you say that from what you know now, um, from what you knew then and the various reports that you had seen, uh, do you think it was fair and accurate to say uh, that the investigation and mediation scheme had demonstrated that there is no evidence of systemic flaws in Horizon and no evidence that any of the convictions are unsafe? <laughs> well, that's, that's a, a, a difficult question. Number one, the post office was saying Horizon, there is no systemic flaws in Horizon. Therefore, it follows that there is no evidence that any of the convictions are unsafe. That's the post office view. It is right to say that the, we did not find the smoking gun. It was found by Mr. Justice Fraser. It was Mr. Justice Fraser that looked at this in huge detail, uh, with Alan Bates, of course, being the lead claimant in the case. But it's right to say nothing came out which showed that there was, was we were looking at individual cases. So it, 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 it wouldn't have happened. What, what we now know is that it was only by going right back into original data, error logs, and et cetera. Was it the purpose of your scheme to uh, identify whether there was or wasn't evidence of systemic flaws in Horizon? Yes. I mean, I think it was, because if you look at the opening lines of the, uh, of the document, uh, it was, it was the, the post office believe it's robust and there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, the postmasters don't agree. This scheme may help to find out which is right. But if you think of the amount of time it took before Mr. Justice Fraser gave his last of his decisions, it's years late, 2019 after weeks of evidence. I'm going to move on now to some differences in opinion between yourself and the post office and their legal advisors. Um, yeah. First, I want to deal with some initial observations on the scheme. Can we look at poll 00116136? I'm afraid we're gonna to have to take these rather quickly. Yes, do. Um, if we look at um, over the page, number four, paragraph four, this is prior to your appointment. So uh, Paul, it's a meeting between yourself with Paula Venels, uh, and there's discussion of your various attributes for the role. Um, at C, it says you suggested quite firmly that it might be more appropriate for cases that have been thought uh, through the courts to be referred to the Criminal Cases Review Commission rather than go through the mediation scheme. Very briefly, what was your view as far as that was concerned? Well, I, I had not 
been involved in this case at all. I've told you already what my state of knowledge was. And I thought at that time that probably convictions should go a separate way. I changed my mind. We looked at many, an, a number of conviction cases. Uh, so it's, it's a sort of very first, if you like, view of something before I really got in to understand what was happening. And I didn't stick to that position, uh, nor did the post office. Uh, and E, um, in the context of a discussion on the outcomes from the mediation process, he observed that sorry was a good word. Uh, we should be prepared to apologize to some postmasters where appropriate. Um, did you continue to hold that view? I do. I've always held that view. I've held that view in so many different cases involving particularly governments who will not apologize at an early stage. Uh, instead of saying, I'm sorry, something went wrong, they continue to fight it out, often at a huge cost to everybody. Can we please look at poll 00066817, please? It's an email from Martin Smith um, to Susan Crichton, to the General Counsel uh, Post Office, uh, and it refers to the note that we've just looked at. And it, in the second paragraph, assesses uh, the paragraph 4C that we've just been mentioning, uh, and he, sa um, he says there, I do not get the feeling that um, he, that's you, are suggesting that all of the criminal cases should be sent to the CCRC, uh, rather than going through the review process, which we're presently conducted, conducting. I think his suggestion is very much in line with the concerns expressed by Brian Altman QC about the dangers of allowing convicted people into the mediation scheme. Brian's view was that the convicted people should instead exhaust such rights of appeal that are open to them. Um, was that the reason that you took that view, that um, convicted people should exhaust the Court of Appeal. But I didn't take the view. I changed my view. Uh, uh, and was that your initial view, though? Was, was it a, along the same lines as that expressed but, by Mr. Altman, or, or a different reason? My initial view was expressed at a meeting when I hadn't been appointed and knew very little about it. If we look down, please, um, it then addresses the issue of the apology, and it says there, uh, Brian expressed a concern that the slightest apology to a convicted person uh, or the payment of compensation could indeed give rise to an appeal. He was concerned that Misra, that's Seema Misra, uh, would use the mediation scheme to obtain some sort of concession to allow her to appeal. I note from paragraph 4E, Sir Anthony Hooper observed that sorry was a good word. If he intends to use it in relation to any convicted person allowed into the mediation scheme, the possibility of a successful appeal may well be increased. Um, can you assist us with your views as to what's written there? My view, by uh, at least the middle of 2014, was there likely to have been serious miscarriages of justice. My initial view that it was very unlikely that these people had stolen their money remained. I wanted people who were probably they'd already left prison, the people who had suffered so badly, I wanted everyone to get on, identify the miscarriages of justice by one route or another, get their convictions quashed. That's what I wanted. And did, did you see any concern with giving an apology that it might give rise to an appeal? Well, you'd apologise because you thought it was all wrong. And therefore there should be an appeal and the conviction should be quashed. I didn't want the delay. We're all aware of the terrible suffering of those who have been convicted. My desire was to try and get things going so that if someone had been wrongly convicted, that could be dealt with. I'm going to... I wasn't worried about all the sort of legalese as to how the Court of Appeal would treat uh, an apology. I'm used to, to many cases where prosecutors have said, we do not resist the appeal against conviction. I'm used to that. I've sat on many cases where prosecutors have said, 
we don't resist the appeal. And I would give a short judgment explaining why I was the prosecutor was right to take that view. I'm going to move on to another difference of opinion that relates to disclosure in ongoing prosecutions. Can we please look at poll 00125071, please? It's the second page, please. It's an email from Andrew Parsons to Martin Smith, uh, copied into Jarnel Singh. And he says as follows, are you generally reviewing these applications to see if they give rise to any disclosable material? I expect so, but best to double check. Uh, the point was raised by Tony Hooper at a meeting last Friday. He also thought that it was obvious that as part of its disclosure duties, the post office should be disclosing anonymized details of each application in prosecutions where Horizon is being questioned. In response, I sat squarely on the fence and said that the applications would be uh, reviewed and proper disclosure required. Uh, d does that accurately reflect the advice yeah. that you gave? Let me explain what I was saying there. One of the arguments that the post office used in many of their investigating reports, as I remember, is that there's nothing wrong with Horizon, and if there was, we'd have had lots of complaints. What I was saying is the very fact that such a significant number of SPMs had raised the issue of the um, uh, robustness, the accuracy, etc., of Horizon was in itself a something that ought to be disclosed. You couldn't keep on saying it's robust, whereas there were probably hundreds of people who had accounts of it not being robust. And some postmasters saying, I, I had £2,000 on the screen, it disappeared. I had 2000 it doubled to 4000 There were lots of those cases. Now, for the post office, that was easy. All they said was, Horizon is robust. Those people are wrong. One of them is a trainer, I think, called Latif, as I subsequently learned. But oh, what I wanted to say was, there were all these complaints. They can't all be absolutely without merit. There must be some problem with Horizon. If, if that be the right, then applicants should know. That's what I was trying to say. Um, and, and then I'm aware there was lots of talk about how I was not following the Attorney General's guidelines and this and that, and well, by all means show them to me. But I was actually trying to get, make sure that the problem that I always thought was there, although I retained my independence as a mediator, as, an, as, a, as the chairman, I always thought there, please, let's get on and solve these, these cases, because I was very fearful. And we can talk about the whole issue of pleading guilty to um, false accounting if you want to ask me questions about that. I, I will so. very briefly. Let, let's just deal with that second point there. That, that yeah. um, Second site believed they had lots of information that might be relevant. Uh, and there's a discussion there of your advice about them um, not being under the post office's control yeah. and was for second site. Well, it turned out I was wrong there. Simon Clark tells me, I read his, I didn't read it at the time, but I've read it since, that Paul had a duty to make inquiries of third parties. All I was interested in was getting the information out. And if the second site did it, they'd do it quickly. Um, can we please quickly look at poll 00407733, and that's the Simon Clark uh, comments that you've just been referring to. I mean, is the difference that we see here that you are saying you're giving advice as to what should be done and what is practical uh, as opposed to a strict legal position? Well, it, I just wanted... If we scroll if down, the, sorry. I feared miscarriages of justice and I wanted everything to be done so that those people could have their convictions quashed before they died. Yes. Uh, we, look, we see there in the second paragraph on the screen... Um, that Mr. Clark disagreed with the generalised approach to disclosure. Uh, and he says um, the correct position remains that it's the duty of the prosecutor to consider material in light of the test for disclosure and to disclose material that meets that test. 
Uh, the higher courts have long since deprecated the practice of throwing open the warehouse doors and disclosing everything in the prosecutor's possession. Uh, was your advice to throw open the warehouse doors? No, it was not. That's an excuse used over and over again. Uh, and what is your view, then, of the position taken? Uh, the by position the is quite clear that things that could assist the convicted defendant to show that his conviction was wrong or the conviction was unsafe must be disclosed. And was it your view that the, the way to do that, uh, or a way to do that, was by disclosing anonymized case studies from uh, that, that you had seen that questioned the reliability of Horizon? That's what I thought. Rightly or wrongly, that's what I thought. Can we please look at poll 00146859? I'm not saying that Simon Clark is wrong and all the law stuff, but I was trying to get this thing going. There was, we now know that my intuition that there were serious miscarriages of justice was right. We now know that. At that time, we didn't know. But I wanted to do all my, do the best I could Thank you. so that people would not die or go bankrupt or whatever it might be, that their convictions would be looked at. In fact, they weren't looked at for when? 2000 and, I can't remember the date, 20? C could we scroll down on this page, please? Again, I mean, it, it is, as you say, much the same. It, it's emails. This is from Jarnel Singh from the post office, and we have another one communicating what is said to be the advice of Brian Altman, uh, QC, uh, regarding the disclosure obligations. Uh, what do you think caused the difference of approach between yourself and the post office in, in respect of disclosure of information that had been brought to your attention? Why do you think the positions are so I, different? I, all, all I can say... No, I, I don't think I can answer that question. Simon Clark, working for... He was counsel. He was Brian a... Altman, advising the post office. I don't think they saw things in the way that I did, but that's their right. Uh, and how would you say they... What was the difference between you, then, in, in that approach? Well, I never saw these advices. I never saw Simon Clark's advice. I never saw Brian Altman's advice. I've now read it. Uh, uh, and I doubt he would be saying what he says in those advices in the light of his later concessions before the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. For them, everything seemed all right. There's nothing wrong with Horizon. There'd be no prosecutorial misbehavior. Now we know that's all wrong. We know there was serious, serious faults with Horizon, and we know there was prosecutorial misbehavior. Did you expect the post office to be taking advice from external lawyers uh, about points that you had made that we've been looking at? That's up to them. Um, I'm going to move on to 2014 and 2015, and this is the very final piece of uh, advice and, and different advice. Also counting and theft. Absolutely. That's um, poll 00006368, please. In fact, there's one before false accounting and theft, and that's the approach to uh, mediation, and that's what we're looking at. Hmm. So two final points. One is the approach to mediation, and the second is the difference between false accounting and so theft. So let's do the second one first. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, in that case, can I take you to... Let's take you to poll 00125777. I mean, I can do it very simply. Second Sight said in the report, there's a difference between false accounting and theft. They no doubt said it because I discussed it with them and said. And then there's a great advice, huge lengthy advices as to whether that is right or wrong. But we know it's right. 
if someone is charged with theft of 10,000 and he pleads not guilty to theft and pleads guilty to false accounting, it is a completely different offence, much less serious, because the cause of the loss was not due to the SBM stealing it. It must be due to some other clerical error or something. Well, SBMs would say it was down to Horizon, but some of them weren't allowed to say that as a condition of their plea, as we now know. So, in real terms, anyone who's practiced criminal law knows that if I'm charged with theft of 10,000 and offered a plea to false accounting, I'll accept it because I'm going to go to prison for theft and I'm not going to go to prison for false accounting normally. Of course, if he's charged with false accounting of 500,000, that's a different matter. But on the facts of these kinds of cases, a loss of 20,000, plead guilty to false accounting will drop the theft. Can we please look at poll 0006366? Zero, 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 yes. zero, six, six, six. And I, I had planned to take you through various passages of this advice, but you've read the full advice. I think you've read it quite recently. Uh, and yes. this is the advice from Mr. Altman on precisely that issue. C can you Should assist I... us with, with why you consider that it isn't put in those stark terms that you've just given to the inquiry in this advice? It, of course it's right, it's the same, the penalty is the same, seven years, you can look at sentencing guidelines, you can read your, but I, I practiced criminal law for 20 years in the Crown Courts, the Magistrates Courts, and I know that a plea of guilty to false accounting is normally going to lead to a completely different sentence than if I plead guilty to theft. If I plead guilty to theft, I'm in, in an employee position, I'm in a breach of trust, and the sentencing guidelines would almost certainly mean that I'm going to have to go to prison. If I plead to false accounting and say, really, I, 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 I covered it up because I thought it would all get right later, uh, I shouldn't have covered it up, I'm sorry, I did it that, that's something which the judge is going to look on and as huge miti as mitigation. So we, we can do all the advice and have pages on it, but in real life... <laughs> Guilty to a false accounting is a sensible way for someone, whether he's innocent or not, to get out of the situation. And it, could we look at page three of this advice, which quotes the words that were set out in a letter to Second Sight on this issue? Uh, now, the post office wrote to Second Sight and said, uh, the suggestion that the offence of false accounting is a less serious offence right. uh, to that of theft is incorrect. Both offences are equal in law. Both are offences of dishonesty and both carry the same maximum sentence. Uh, you have that letter. You have this advice. In your view, what went wrong at the post office end to have such a fundamentally different position to the one that you've just explained uh, to the inquiry today? It's theoretical. It's not the real world. And if you look at the real world, the real world is well described in um, Jane McLeod's letter. You have, a, you have a, a loss of money, you have a false accounting, therefore you charge theft. That's what she said in, a, in one of her letters. And people, whether guilty or not, are likely to plead to false accounting. They don't want to go to prison. And, of course, there was often a requirement to disgorge the money. So it was a very simple and easy way of getting your money back. The chair has now, to... We now, we now know all those convictions are, by and large, unsafe. The chair has to make recommendations in due course, and, and there are those watching this inquiry who are interested in matters of legal ethics, etc. Why do you think it is that a lawyer advising the post office doesn't say exactly what you've said today on the difference. I know. I don't think that's a fair... I don't think I can answer that question. I, I'll leave it to the chairman. Well, <laughs> that, that, that's fine. And I, I, I'm not going to hide this. Um, no doubt we'll hear from Mr. Altman about his real-life experience. But I, too, have practised in Crown Courts for many years and sat as a judge for many years. 
And my real life experience is exactly the same as Sir Anthony Hooper's. Thank you. I'm going to ask very final questions now. Um, I don't think I need to ask the difference of opinion in relation to the mediation of cases. Um, no. That's set out in the documents. Um, a question that's been raised by a core participant, it relates to the retention of materials from your working group. Are, are you were aware of any discussions with the post office about their retention of any uh, documentation relating to the work that was being carried out? It might have been discussed. I certainly wouldn't remember today. Uh, and one thing that you... I would hope that they retained all the documents. That's what I would hope. One of the matters that you've raised today is about following the money, and that was one of the core issues or approaches that you wanted to take. Uh, were there issues with the production of accounts, for example, showing losses? Uh, yes, I mean, there's the one about suspense accounts. I, I couldn't understand where the money had gone. If a, a sub-postmaster found a loss of 2000 and paid it out of his own pocket, or her own pocket, which they did, or it was taken off future um, income, where had the money gone? And so I asked, started asking towards the end of 2014 for suspense accounts. Because I thought that I knew that there were suspense accounts. I knew that profit, the post office, after three years, took out the profits from the suspense accounts, and I wanted to know more about it. I got absolutely nowhere. And nor did Second Sight. They repeated it again in 2016. So just because I'm interested, I read Mr. Justice Fraser's uh, decision insofar as it related to suspense accounts. And he said that when it got to the civil proceedings, the post office pleaded that they didn't understand what suspense accounts were about. A, 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 an approach which Mr. Justice Fraser, in my view, rightly said, disapproved of. So there's just one example. Uh, Where had the money gone? Who is it that you had been asking um, with regards to suspense accounts as an example? You say At the working group, you'll see it in the minutes. You can find it in the minutes, two or three cases where I said, where, what, what's happened? And I was told it would take too long or they hadn't got it or anything. It's just one example. Thank you very much. Uh, Sir Anthony, it has been a whistle-stop tour this afternoon. We've had, unfortunately, rather limited time. But is there anything that you would like to add that uh, we haven't addressed today? I don't know. It's the greatest scandal that I have ever seen in the criminal justice process. We've had many miscarriages of justice, but nowhere near as many of these. We need to reevaluate how we approach criminal cases of this kind. Something is, went very, very wrong. And I don't envy the chairman's task in trying to find out how it all started. Something went very, very wrong. I think, in part, it's a much wider question, and that is the obligation of a prosecutor. Because all that a prosecutor has to establish in order deciding whether to indict someone, apart from the public good public good test, is whether there is enough evidence to support a conviction. That is a very low threshold. It means that defense have to do a large amount of work to see whether there is some alternative to, uh, to guilty. And with the decline in legal aid, with senior members of the bar who in my day practiced the criminal bar and, and did so on legal aid, that's all gone now or largely gone, I am very worried about the way we approach our justice trials. That's a much bigger question, perhaps, than needs to be resolved here. But underlying all of this are the, the two, the major defect 
of miscarriage of justice in the common law across the world, United States, Britain, is non-disclosure. Over and over again. I don't know how many trials I did in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division of non relating to serious non-disclosure. And secondly, this notion that all that has to be shown by the prosecutor is a sufficient evidence upon which a jury could convict. Very much. Thank you very much. Sir, do you have any questions before we finish for the day? Thank you very much. Are there any questions from co-participants? No, I don't believe so. No. Well then, thank you very much, Sir Anthony, for making uh, the time to um, write a witness statement and to appear to give evidence. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we'll reconvene at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, yes, Mr. Blake? We will. Thank you very much, sir.